Welcome to Fire Breathing Kittens, an actual play Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Every episode has a self-contained plot with a beginning and an end, so you can listen to these adventures in any order. Today is a special episode, and last week's was too. These are companion episodes. The NPCs presented to the players will be mostly the same, and it's their choices that determine the outcome. Each microplot in Fire Breathing Kittens fits into the overarching macroplot of the whole season. Today we are joined by... Simmond the Kind. Howdy, guys. I'm Simmond. I am a level 17, I believe. Um, Druid. I am very large and faintly blue. Uh, I am a bugbear, which is kind of a hill giant kind of kind of guy. Um, I have some dragon scale armor that's relatively new, and I have a really fancy stick, and I talk to a lot of animals. Hi, that's me. <laughs> Zero Luminous. Hi guys, my name is Zero. I am a level 17 paladin. I am very pale skinned, around 5'5", five five, brown hair. I have some museum armor on that's mostly white, and I have a lightning tongue blade, and that's about it. And Wavellian Willy Von Erden. Lurking in the darkness, in the deepest corners of your nightmares. It's me, Willy. How's it going, guys? I'm everybody's favorite dead boy. <laughs> I'm like six and a half feet tall. My teeth are like a combination of shark or eel teeth because I'm from the ocean. Uh, I recently put my father and uncle's souls to rest, so I'm going through a bit of a thing right now. But being a warlock, paladin, barbarian, I'm used to, you know, having a lot going on. Uh, I wear, like, super dope armor. It's, like, black and enchanted, so my billowing cloak that covers it extends like I'm cloaked in shadow stuff itself, but it's a very basic, like, 200 gold piece fit. <laughs> I've talked about it before. Uh, yeah. Dead. Killed my father. Cool armor. That's Willy. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, like, originally a yuan T or something like that? Uh, yeah, apparently my mother was a yuan T, and my dad was just a guy who became a lich with his brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I got that going. I got dead guys in my blood, and also, I don't know, I, I would like to see my mother. I hope there's there's no strong female characters in this episode, because <laughs> I'm dealing with a lot of mommy issues. <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to hear more about that, listen to Willie's Birthday Bonanza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if there. Are... We'll see. We'll see. Hey, uh, you know who knows what anything is. In fact, who knows where you are right now, Simmond? You feel confined by a stiff uniform, ironed black slacks, white button-up shirt, a suit jacket too tight in the shoulders. Your arms are heavy. They are heavy because you are holding a tray, standing beside a fresco-covered wall in a vast open ballroom. The weight lightens. A handsome man has just accepted a glass of wine from your serving tray, his broad shoulders and beautiful wings turning away from you as he looks upward at a chandelier far above you. Chandelier. Chandelier. <laughs> far above you. <laughs> this is surprising. We're in a ballroom. Okay. Do I remember how we got here? The last thing you remember was falling asleep. Where do you normally fall asleep at, Simmond? In my room at the guild hall. And as that beautiful man accepts the glass of wine from your serving tray, his broad shoulders and wings turning away from you as he looks upward at the chandelier far above you. Hell yeah. We, we fade from Simmond, who's just confused and looking around, being like, I was at the guild hall. <laughs> Zero. There's a gust of air next to your face. A swinging door. You are standing in the doorway to the kitchens, hand outstretched as you were apparently in the process of receiving a tray of wine glasses from a moth-winged person wearing a chef's coat. Make a dexterity saving throw to determine whether or not you gracefully accept the serving platter. I got a 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just want to say, uh, I... I assumed that you were more dexterous. 
You added your dexterity saving throw bonus to that, right? Yeah, that's a negative one. <laughs> and your paladin bonus from your aura. Yeah, you you get like all the charisma modifier to plus okay. six. Because yeah. <laughs> For the listeners. Oh, plus uh, six. Oh, okay. So we're at an eighteen. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. So if you hadn't rolled incredibly low, you would have passed because you. Yeah. You. Okay. So um. But dice are dice. So <laughs> noted. <laughs> Willie, you look down at your hands, at the knife you're clutching, at chicken wings and a half-sliced onion on a cutting board in front of you. Light glints off the copper blade. Your eyes sting and water from the onion. The kitchen bustles with moth-winged staff roasting, bruleeing, and sautéing bite-sized canapés for a gala. Looking out from the kitchens, you see a man with sharp facial features attempt to accept a tray of wine glasses. His moth wings flutter in surprise, revealing eye spots, lifting him off the ground an inch as he corrects his balance to account for the tray. The wine in the glasses shifts precariously. Trying to adjust his course and not spill a single drop of wine, he flaps his wings a full extension and shoots upward, airborne. It's as if he's new to flying and doesn't know what he's doing. Struggling, the insectoid moth person spirals, wine cascading to the parquet floor, gold dust billowing, each frenzied flap driving him dangerously closer to the extravagant crystal chandelier. Do I have eyes? You do have eyes. W Willie is shook and like literally poking himself in what are supposed to be empty smoking sockets. Oh, I'm sorry. You, uh, mm. You have empty smoking socket. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank God. As I, like, f f put my fingers in my skull cavity, I'm like, oh, thank God, I thought I had eyes for a second. Uh, but I, uh, still very concerned. This is not my knife. I don't use a knife. I use a big, big boy sword. <laughs> um, but I note the beauty of this, uh, newly flying creature. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, noted. I'm going to go to the section that says if they respond in a way that does not intervene. <laughs> I mean, I'm at work right now, I think, so I have onions to cut. We're all at work right now. <laughs> yeah. Is this I'm the same gonna... chandelier that I'm viewing? Chandelier. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I can also see a haphazardly flying creature heading towards the chandelier. Yes, chandelier. you can. I'm so sorry. Mm. I won't do it again, then. I am going to position myself. I'm going to start moving to position myself underneath the flying creature. Okay. Uh, make a. Yeah, this is dexterity. Make an acrobatics saving. An acrobatics check. Uh, because when you move, you move very rapidly. So it's not sure. at all a strength check. You move. The question is in what direction? Acrobatics is a minus one. So I got a 10. Oh, gosh. <laughs> 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 Willie, as you watch through the serving door, another one shoots into a wall. Uh, so, <laughs> do I? Can, okay. it's do okay. I have coworkers? <laughs> yeah, you have coworkers. Everybody's staring. Um, okay, so the chef who handed him the tray flaps their own wings once purposefully. She rockets off the ground, intervening before the wait staff. Which this is not seven. This is zero. Before the waitstaff's head can collide with the crystal chandelier, the chef tackles the waiter in the midsection, grapples, changes direction, and lands outside the kitchen. As the chef's feet touch the ground, the wine splashes and splatters on the parquet floor. But even louder is the slap as the chef unleashes a barrage of abuse upon the server. Fancily dressed, moth-winged aristocrats continue sipping wine and smiling at one another, ignoring the abuse as if nothing were amiss. The yelling chef literally kicks the server into the kitchen. Your fellow kitchen staff continue working as if this were normal, and the chef unleashes one last scream for the waiter to chop onions, gesturing to the cutting board next to you, Willie. Your eyes meet, Willie and Zero. And everything fades away for all three of you. <laughs> One of you got knocked out by flying himself into a wall. Good morning! Where do each of you open your eyes when you wake up? Willie doesn't sleep. What oh, yeah. The, what the expletive is going on? You were zoning out. You were daydreaming. 
ah, I hate this. So I, he's staring. He's supposed to be staring at a spider and then just sort of like shakes out of it. Okay. Um, Simmond wakes up in his familiar room in uh, the guild hall. It is a small room. It has a bunk bed on one side and it has uh, a large tank of water occupying about half of the room. Okay. Zero wakes up on the guild hall roof with a cute fluffy little squirrel next to him. Just waking up, just sun shining, beautiful day outside. Hell yeah, bro. I love that for you. I love it for me, too. <laughs> so does Willie... We remember the... I, what, what I'm going to call a dream? Daydream. I, we, okay. Uh, and I've met Zero before, right? Mm-hmm. Like, from work? Mm-hmm. Uh... Zero, you think we're familiar enough uh, that I know you sleep on the roof? Yeah. I rush up to the roof. Actually, no, I straight up, I call Margaret, and she uses her climb speed to go up the side <laughs> of the guild hall wall. Question. What is Margaret? Um, Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. Uh, Margaret is my mount, which is a uh, sable, like an all-black sable uh, the size of a horse. So, like, a big weasel that comes out of my cloak. Oh, I thought it was a spider. We were about to go a different direction. Okay, we're good. No, no, my spider. the spider's just my friend. Uh, what were you asking, Simmond? In in the, the daydream, you did not see Zero's face, correct? You saw a mo- you saw an Ekenblem. Oh. Right? We all did, correct? Di- okay, was, DM, was it indicative enough to where, like, when you're, like, at the very least, I could be like, hey, Zero, I saw you in my dream, which apparently I have now, and you look like a weird moth guy. <laughs> but, like, Willie's fought with, like, around the Echo Blim. He's not going to play fully ignorant to this. Did he look uh, Echo Blimified? He, like, you know the before and after on a makeup glow up? Hmm. Yeah, he looked like the after. Okay, so it was familiar enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was Zero, for sure. Okay. But. Uh, you know, not the same. So yeah, I, Margaret, my cloak comes out. I like m- mount her. She like goes fully vertical up the side of a wall. Uh, it, it's probably what like thirty feet. <laughs> so like six seconds later, I'm up at the top. I dismount, return her to my cloak dramatically. <laughs> Zero. First of all, looking great. Love this for you. Get some, getting some sun. Uh, I had a dream, which is problematic, and you were in it, but you were a Echo Blim. Zero is gonna go ahead and react, unable to hear him entirely because he still has this hat on that has all these voices in his head. So he's gonna go ahead and reach up and try to use cleansing touch to take the hat off really quick so we can just get rid of that. Oh yeah, that's a paladin ability. Let me look that up real quick because I don't have my jade sheet. Cleansing touch 5e. Doesn't that end spells? It just ends spells, yeah. And technically a curse is a spell. Uh, I think you gotta have Dispel Curse uh, to end curses. Uh, so Willie's getting annoyed that he's not getting enough attention, so he will come up and rip the hat off of his head. But oh, being... No. Oh, um, well, you tug on it. Do a strength check. I have removed curse. <laughs> so I was going to flavor it as, uh, you know, because I was raised by hags to give out curses. So curse magic is just in my blood. So, like, even without knowing it, like, almost the king casts the spell. The spirit inside me, the king of all creation. Um, and, it, like, I, without thinking, rip the hat off uh, and remove the curse. Zero, I'm freaking talking to you, man. <laughs> what were you saying? I couldn't hear you. I had this hat on with voices. Oh my god, thank god that's off. That was so annoying. <laughs> uh, I, I put the hat into my, like, void cloak. Because, uh, you know, I love curse shit. Uh, stuff, sorry. <laughs> I love curse stuff. Um, and cursing, apparently. <laughs> uh, I had a dream, and I don't sleep. In which you were an echo blim, and you're really just absolute trash at flying. Well, thank you for the small read there. I also had a dream that you were it, it, an echo it, blim as well, and then somebody beat me, and then Simon just 
flew into a wall? Like, what is going on? What? Okay, in your dream, did you get just the absolute tar kicked out of you by a chef? Yes, by some girl that I'm going to go beat up now. Like, who was she and why was she beating me up? Oh, this is not good. We need to get Simmed. Absolutely. I'm sure he's probably in his room. Uh, so I, Margaret, throw out my cloak, um, like motion for you to climb aboard, and then we'll again vertically go down the wall outside of Simmons' window. <laughs> okay. It's faster this way. Okay, Zero's just going to be holding on a little shot. <laughs> you open the door to Simmons' room and it is empty. What? I crawl in through his window. Yeah, you see, you see the bed. It looks like it has been hastily gotten out of. Uh, you see the water tank, which has been empty for quite some time. It's collecting a lot of dust. Um, and the door, the door is already thrown open. What? Sim Simon loves water. He'd never let his water levels get this low. Oh, this is bad business, Zero. Willie looks at you with his smoking green pits. He has like, like a, just a big shock like at this point it's almost like uh the the chick's hair in brave or like nightmare before the, christmas just a massive shock of curls that he's pulled back <laughs> like sort of behind his head he used to hide his face and his smoking pits but now he's proud of them and part of that is the lesson that he learned while being a friend to simon the kind and now where the expletive is simon Zero's gonna go ahead and stare into his smoking pits with <laughs> a shocked look on his face. Because he's still, I mean, he's still kind of new to the guild and the guild hall, so he's still getting used to all these characters, just thinking in his head, just kind of like, what did I get myself into? And he's gonna go ahead and respond. <laughs> to it's very Willy. simple. I'm a curse breaking dead guy who rides a giant weasel who lives in his jacket. I know, nothing weird about that at all. Simple <laughs> as So Zero's going to go ahead and look at Willy, and just we should probably go ahead and try to find out where Simon went off to. Can this thing get into high gear and check the area? Uh, so I'm basically picturing, like, Toothless from How, How to Train Your Dragon, where just this big smoking ink blot of a giant weasel is, like, face in the window. And I'm like, oh, Margaret can book it. But I make an investigation check first because I want to see what's up with this room. Because it is weird that the water tank is low. Like, even if he left hastily, like, why is his stuff empty? That's Aaron's tank. Oh, uh... shit. Then what? And where the hell is it? Aaron? He's been gone the whole season. What? He doesn't even, like, hang out? Oh. No wonder my texts aren't getting replied to. <laughs> <laughs> quick check for... Well, quick check for all of us who don't know who's Aaron. Aaron is Simmons' boyfriend. He became a god at the end of the last season, and he just hasn't been around much. He's been too busy. Oh, okay. Roll an investigation check, and if you beat a 12, you'll get a clue, and if you beat a 17, Simmons will give you two clues. Uh, well, I think, uh, how, how does, uh, what would, uh, 21 get me? <laughs> Too close, but... Uh, it sounds like too close. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, Simmons' feet sweat at night, so you can still see some, uh, moist footprints going off around the corner towards the staircase, and you can see that Simmons' weapons are not in the room. Uh, so yeah, Willie notices the footprints, like gets down hands and knees, licks the sweat and goes, it's Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dead paladin. I'm not going to get sick. <laughs> I lick floors all the time. <laughs> you can literally cut my arm off and it'll grow back in a week. Uh, so I'm going to follow it and the weapons aren't there. That's not good. I motion to zero like... Simmons, Simmons, like out and equipped, you know. I kind of give give like a open palm gesture twice forcefully at the empty weapon rack. Zero's gonna go ahead and just think that's really gross. Looking at the sweaty footprints, it's <laughs> fresh. Follow Willie wherever <laughs> Willie's going. Where do you go? Uh, the direction of the footprints. 
until it, the trail ends. And then I imagine like a yellow circle will show up and they'll say investigate the area. But uh, oh. yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you follow this, the trail down the stairs and you round a corner and you find Sibin pops out from behind the corner and says, hey, stand back. I like I, I'm, I'm again I'm a big strong boy but impulsively you're so direct I'm like I put my hands up and like oh I'm cool man I'm cool yeah Simon looks scary he's got he's got um his oh uh, what is that thing called uh Muscles. Well, his main attacking ability well yes he's got those <laughs> but no uh he's got primal savagery enacted so his his hands are big hulk fists and uh he's like Show yourselves. Let me see your eyes. I don't have them, man. I don't have them. <laughs> I motion towards my pits. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen through my eyes since I was a baby, dude. I had a very strange dream that you lot were cavorting with the Ekenblem. Just because I want a Hulk fight, Willie goes into a rage and does a thing where we clasp hands. <laughs> Give some strength I'm checks. sorry. You're going to try to clasp hands with somebody who has giant strength? Opposing yeah, strength checks? Yes. <laughs> there, there really needs to be some mechanic for this in... Because, like, there, this there is, is a racial is. ability. Grapple check. No, no, no. No, no, Like, a, a, a thing for for the fact that a normal person is never going to beat his grapple check. That's Does not how D&D &D works. Bill. There's no such thing as never. There's just and not I'm a I normal know. person. I'm, a, I'm in a barbarian rage. So I do get advantage on my checks. Yeah, roll a... Uh, so the way the grapple works in 5e, I'm going to read the exact rules. Hulk fight, Hulk fight, Hulk fight. Zero I mean, is just space checks right in the background grapple. while this is happening. <laughs> uh, grappling uses the attack action and is not its own action. It is a spe special melee attack, which means that it's done in melee. It interacts with... When you gra want to grab a creature or wrestle with it, you can use the attack action. Oh. No, I mean, I remember how to grapple. You can only... Yeah, I just... We well, can okay. just strength roll off, and I'll tell you, I you did make bad. a strength check contested by your target's strength or dexterity. So the person doing the grapple, which I guess is Willy, does a strength check. And then Simon can use either a strength or a dexterity. So you roll a dice, and then you add your strength or dexterity modifier to it. So what's your strength or dexterity modifier, Simon? I'm going to choose strength. Okay. Um, plus two. And I rolled an 18. Now, when you have a racial ability, what is that called? So this doesn't really go into grapples, but I feel like it should. It's called What's powerful it called? build. Yeah. Powerful. It's carry, push, drag, or lift as if large size. Example, this is often used to throw large boulders incredible distances. All right. Official ruling powerful build doesn't apply to the grapple check. Whoa. Yeah. It's weird. I just, I feel like it should. I don't know. Okay. Because there then... was a... Oh, there was a version that, like, it's similar where you're treated as a large creature, even yes. though you're medium. But that's interesting they made that distinction for them. And I'd like to say I've added a rule to Fire Breathing Kittens, which is for player versus player, the person who's being targeted can choose to make the targeter auto fail. So, um, the, uh, I this love was this literally PvP. A, it's I, just a bit that was getting out of hand at this oh, point. No, no, it I wasn't just, attempting I want to introduce to... this. Um, so, I, I think that. Like, the PvP rules in D&D &D don't ever explicitly say this, but I love the idea that you can choose whether or not the person rolls or fails. So if you say, it's like an added layer of consent. If you say, I'm being targeted by PB PvP, I want the target the person targeting me to auto-fail, I like that you can consent to the roll. You know, you can be like, no, let's do this, let's roll, you know? So, Simmons player, do you consent to the roll? Sure. Okay, then yeah, you can Willie got a 12. <laughs> with advantage I got a 20 yeah. <laughs> so i think that that what happens with this is that you attempt to attack and simon just wraps you up in one arm <laughs> and lifts you up off the ground and goes mhm mm let's just take a look for some wings here and he kind of pulls up the back of your cloak and looking down your back here uh yeah and it's, to be clear, not attempting to an attack, just wanted to do the thing they do in superhero movies when they're like, ooh, 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 like, you know, um, totally failed. So, uh, yeah, and that's very impressive because Willie is very tall. So like the, well, you're big too. I'm like eight feet tall. Oh yeah. You're bigger than me. Oh, Put me down. I'm going to tell the noodle sack. 
Noodle Sag! Noodle Sag. Simmons bullying me! Simmons bullying! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the tall team. We've got eight feet, seven feet, and then how tall is zero? Five five. five. Oh, you short it five five. <laughs> it's just it's it. funny if you listen to the other episode because it's it's very much the opposite. Um, you would have been the tallest one there. Uh, so so <laughs> the Mulus egg comes uh calls out to you three. Simmond, zero, Willie, come to my office. Is this the guild important. leader? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're the one who gave you the tattoo. Okay, Zero's gonna go ahead and look at both Sim and Willie and just be like, can we stop this conflory and just go to this office? We're obviously not moth people. We would have very evident wings and bug eyes. So let's figure this out after we're done. Willie is stripping his clothes off, and then he, upon hearing that, is like, oh, I might have got, I got, I'm getting a little wild here, guys. And pulls his pants up. D- did I have any sort of sprouting moth wings, though, Simon? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> we'll have to inspect Zero later. I oh. don't. Like, as we're walking up to Nula Sag's office, I'm like, I don't like this, man. I already had those freaking hags do magic on my body when I was a child, and these Equiblim freak me out. We go into Nula Sag's room. Yes. Uh, Zero, you also do. Yeah. Okay. All three of you do. Okay. So there is a person sitting in one of the four chairs across the desk from Nulasag, who is a tiny two foot tall elderly dwarf man sitting in a chair at a giant mahogany desk uh is he a dwarf yeah he's a dwarf Mm -hmm. i thought he was a gnome he's a dwarf and he's yeah i I always pictured him hot is that weird yes you can picture him whatever you want he's i thought he was like a stocky built like you know gruff old okay all right yeah I always pictured like the people that work in the bank in, in, in Harry Potter. Oh, I'm picturing like like old like old blacksmith where his body's like weathered from being an adventurer for so long. <laughs> he has had his tales. I don't think they're on the podcast, but they're on the YouTube. But um, anyway, but he's had adventures. He the old weathered adventurer uh, makes sense. In fact, you'd say the bartender being a level twenty druid is also pretty strange. Um, anyway. Nusi, she's a, so. Uh, there's a person sitting across from him. She is five foot two inch tall, 110 pounds, platinum blonde, half gnome, half elf, with rosy skin and green eyes. And she's got a determined look on her face as she turns to you three. When she turns and fixes her attention on you, you see that she's wearing a deep green shirt with a black waistcoat embroidered with green flowers. She's wearing black pants. Calf high boots and a short black cloak. Nulasag, once you uh, close the door to his office, and, and I guess, are you sitting down in the chairs? Let's find out. Are you guys sitting down in the three I'll be chairs? standing against the wall. Uh, I will go to close the door, so I'm currently up, but I'm going to just touch in my ear where I have one of my earrings of message. And I guess because zero... I saw Zero in the dream, so he's going to be my primary. I'm going to send it to him. And I would like to make a check myself in the process. Does this look like a de equiblimified chef? No. (laughs) Okay. But I send that message to Zero. I'm like, I don't know. Is this that dream? That horrible dream woman? They can do magic, you know. (laughs) They look like anything. It's disgusting. (laughs) Zero's gonna go ahead and respond and be like, no, I do not think it is. Cool. Uh, Then Willie will just close the door and then go sit down. Hands on his knees. (laughs) Simmons will sit down and tell Nula Sag, it sounds as though you have a visitor, uh, but there is something else that we should discuss at some time. Yes, I have a visitor. This is Anaril Evanera. Anaril is hiring capable test subjects. It's quite the interesting proposition. Such a clever discovery. Sim and Zero and Willy are actually perfect fits for this. Anaril blushes at being called clever. She says, Sim and Zero, Willy, looking at all of you learning your names. What do you know about Ekimblim? Oh, I'm sorry. She has a voice. Sim and Zero, Willy, what do you know about Ekimblim? Willy was unsure for a moment, but yeah, upon sorry. hearing the voice goes, you're Rooney's sister. <laughs> ah, we've met. Remember in the in the forest? Yeah. I... Rudy's doing great, by the way. That's good to hear. Is she doing magical research? 
Yes, super impressive magical research. Like, might honestly trump yours, but what, what's the thing you're doing? <laughs> really is ride or die for his guildmates. <laughs> <laughs> and canonically hates siblings. <laughs> I've been researching the Ekenblim. What do you all know about the Ekenblim? I know that they're bug people and their dust turns people into zombies. Zero's gonna go ahead and say, I know that their dust turn a bunch of cupcakes into killer things. Willy, like, his cloak starts to billow. They're terrifying creatures from another plane that are invading, stealing the young and beautiful from our realm for their own devilish delights. <laughs> I love that I get to ask that to the person who's doing the season finale. <laughs> <What do laughs> yeah, you know? no, you go come to me with a expletive echo blim i know about expletive echo blim <laughs> uh, player versus character knowledge all right so <laughs> she responds to each of you she says yes i've been investigating this dust that they shed it's so incredibly magical i've used it as the power source to cast very high level transfiguration conjuration and enchantment spells spells way stronger than i could honestly have cast myself yeah you're not quite as good as Rooney at magic <clears throat> when you sing, you can tap into it, like so. Hum. As she hums, the gold dust vibrates and hums back. Hum. My theory is that, like insects, the Ekenblim have a brief hive mind moment. Not all the time, but there's a flash of a psychic connection to one another just before they hatch. Maybe I could physically teleport you all in to observe right at the moment of the psychic connection? It's taken me forever, but I've finally hacked through the anti-teleportation firewall protecting one of the Ekenblim Hive palaces. What do you think? Are you in? I think this is a good time to share a recent story. Willie gasps. So, I can't be sure, but I think that we had a shared dream where we were transformed into Ekenblim. Yes, and Zero was bad at flying. <laughs> yes, and I attempted to catch him. <laughs> And, and you flew, and into, you flew a into a wall. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I didn't see Willie there, but I gather that he was there as well. Because I was doing my job. <laughs> what was your job? I was a... Oh, God, what sort of frightful nightmare. I was a... A line cook. That tracks. All right. <laughs> um, so... I was very cautious when we woke up. I was concerned that maybe we had become contaminated with Ekenblim dust or something. I, I, I've examined these two as best I can so far, but I don't see any physical changes right now. But this does seem related, wouldn't you say? Wow, that's interesting. Interesting. You had a dream about being Ekenblim. She looks happy, her face flushing. I've never tried this before, so I was wondering how the psychic connection would ripple. Interesting. Through time. Well, now we know this works. That's excellent, Simmond. Oh, so I guess we already know that we agree to this. <laughs> that must be what that was. Oh, like, I recently found out that my family has been apparently fighting Echo Blim for, like, generations. So this is kind of, I'm, I, I'm involved whether I want it or not. Also, I'm, I've, I've been soaking myself in dust. Because, <laughs> uh, you said a bunch of magical properties, and I didn't hear anything about necromancy. The Echo Blim make undead. And yet you detect no necromatic magic in their dust? The very thing that turns life into unlife, and as a being on the razor's edge of life and death, I'm getting more dramatic, uh, I find this deeply curious. She goes, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Let me try it. And she hums a note, and she's like, mm, necromantic note, and it vibrates bom, really bom. strongly, and she's like, wow. Ah, I expert even knew it. Ah, I Frickin' knew it! Zero's gonna... Throw a bunch of dust in the air. <laughs> Zero's gonna go ahead and interject. I don't really trust this situation. This girl doesn't seem like she knows what she's actually doing. <laughs> oh, well, she's definitely the lesser sister, because Rooney's so cool. Oh. But she's very good at what she does. I trust her implicitly. I'm glad <laughs> one of us does. Uh, alright, so... New Lasag has never steered us wrong, so... All no, right. 
Except for that one time you got turned into a, uh, the doppelganger situation. I remember, but we fixed that already. <laughs> you remember the changeling year? That was a rough time. <laughs> well, this is the Ekenblem year, so I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you guys were so scarred by cucurbitacin. I love it. All right, so uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of Nulisag, he pipes up and he says, Oh, I have negotiated a pretty good pay for you guys. 75,000 gold each to you or your surviving next of kin. Anaril has already paid me. Who would you like to designate as your next of kin? Oh, Willie gets deeply sad. So does Simmons. He doesn't <laughs> have next of kin. So does Yuri. Uh, he doesn't either. Can we just start crying and <laughs> hug each other? No. <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I can have a next of kin. I, I don't bleed. I'm dead. Yeah, I, oh my god, I, we have so few meaningful connections in our lives. I mean, I met this girl, and she's like, really cool, we've been hanging out a bunch, but I'm like, I'm like a curse man. What if I curse her? Well, at least you can leave her the money. All right. I I, I guess... No, that's that's pretty weird. Uh, <laughs> All I have is Aaron, he doesn't need money anymore. Oh, frick, I guess I gotta leave it to Tanninger. <laughs> <laughs> so Tanninger needs the help. I yeah, mean, yeah, like sure. I'm, re I'm reevaluating my life because Tanninger Goodfellow is my emergency contact. <laughs> I'll go ahead and leave mine to Tanninger too. Whatever. Zero, you went for Tanninger. <laughs> Zero's just gonna be really quiet, just thinking about you know how like his one next to kin he had to shove a whole sword through to kill. <laughs> way earlier and I guess I'll just leave it to Tanager. He doesn't know who that is, but it sounds good. <laughs> Tanager is just like sipping like a, a mostly whiskey cup of tea and just the teacup breaks. What? <laughs> uh, okay. That's wild. We've all designated. <laughs> freaking sad boys over here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so yeah, you fill out the paperwork, you cross your T's and dot your I's, and the the money's going... I like how none of you said a charity. You're all just... <laughs> no, just had it. <laughs> yeah. Two paladins, no charity. Yeah, his life is a mess. He's so deepened with the mob, it's not, it's not great. <laughs> this is why there are still orphans, Nick and Moy. <laughs> so... Plus, have you seen his stage show? It's pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you yeah, you start the preparations. Anaril goes over to an open area and sprinkles some dust on the ground in a circle in Nulisag's office. There's the teleportation circle made of Ekenblim wing dust. Step inside and sing a note and don't think about anywhere in particular. If you do, you're likely to teleport there. Fighting against your destination will take my attention and make it harder for me to hack into their defenses. So don't. Just sing a note and think of nowhere. Can we wait one hour? Yeah. Cool. Warlocks only have two spell slots. I know, and you remove cursed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Willie goes and makes lunch for everyone to make sure we're fed before we go in. Um, Good. He's, like, getting... Ooh, he feels weird because he used to not eat... And now he does eat, and he's actually a pretty good chef. And as he's holding, like, a shadow knife that he, like, made out of, you know, because he's a hexblade or all that, he's like, whoa, deja vu. <laughs> Are you all ready? Yes. Yeah. The gold dust... Oh, I have to wait. <clears throat> Step inside and sing a note, and don't think about anywhere in particular. Do we have to make a check, or... No, or is this just goes? Oh, fuck it. We're sorry. Wi <laughs> Willie's fully thinking about Roxy. <laughs> what if I don't sing? Oh, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> All three at the same time. You can do it. Oh, oh, oh. okay. You actually want it. Okay. The gold dust resonates with the notes you sing. It vibrates and lights up, getting brighter and brighter. Whoosh! Bright light and golden sprinkles are all you can see. Willie and Zero, please take off your headphones and I'll wave you back in. Oh no, is this because I ghostbustered? <laughs> this is before <laughs> the game you all consented to this. <laughs> so, alright. <laughs> Simmond, the light fades and you can see you are alone. You are alone in a tiny room, 
smaller than a bathroom stall, with white wallpaper a mere arm's reach away from you in all directions. Hmm, that's not wallpaper. Do you touch it? I inspect it first. Okay, I'm going to go to the no. I do not touch it. The air tastes weird. It's tingly. You're breathing in, inspecting this white wall, breathing in, and the air is tingly. And there's something you're leaning against, like a wall, but it's not smooth. In fact, your back hurts a lot, and the tingles condense at that pain. You feel yourself sprout a pair of moth wings, which you can't open in this tiny space. There's something else firm on your side that is not the cotton ball fabric of these narrow walls. Something firm. Hmm. Can I see anything? Maybe if you rotated. I try to rotate. Okay. You can hardly rotate in this narrow space. Picture like the world's smallest bathroom stall. Yep. But you manage it. Ah! Inches away from you, eyes closed, ceramic face <gasps> still as if sleeping. <sighs> You've been backed up against the empty body of a mid-transformation Ekenblim. The skin is hardening like porcelain, like an exoskeleton. Okay. Uh, I feel like I'm probably in some kind of, like, little cocoon. So I'm going to look at the end of the cocoon. Does it look like I can burst through? Yes. It's a white, um, wallpapery, fabric-y. I'm going to try to jump through it. Okay. I mean, again, you are in a, you cannot extend your arms without touching it. So yeah. you're going to rip through it like a football player on a Friday night. Yep. All right. You emerge from the cocoon into a room. It's a cavern. It's arched like a Pringles can. So it's a long tunnel. It's arched like a Pringles can. Person height egg cases are all around. Please remove your headphones and I'll wave you back in. You have wings. Oh. <laughs> what up? <laughs> all right. Willie, take your headphones off again. <laughs> <laughs> wave you back wave in. me in for. I'll wave you back in. I can only wave it in general. Just because I ghostbustered. <laughs> no. Okay. I can't specifically wave. Okay. Zero. The light fades and you can see you are alone. You are alone in a tiny room, smaller than a bathroom stall, with white wallpaper a mere arm's reach away from you in all directions. Hmm. That's not wallpaper. Do you touch it? Mm, I'm going to go ahead and do an investigation real quick, if that's okay. By doing what? Just observing further for anything else before I touch this wallpaper. <laughs> okay. You breathe in the air and you don't touch it. The air tastes weird. It's tingly. And there's something you're leaning against. It's not smooth like a wall. Your back hurts a lot. The more you breathe, the tingles that you're breathing in condense at that pain in your back. You feel yourself sprout a pair of moth wings, which you can't open in this tiny space. And there's something else firm on your side that's bumpy and is not the cotton fabric of these narrow walls. Uh, Zero's gonna go ahead and start freaking out a little bit. Oh my god, I turned into an echo blim. Lord Jesus. <laughs> um, he's gonna try to get out of whatever space he's in. You flail your arms, you're flailing at the firm thing behind you without looking at it, and you emerge from a cocoon, because as your arms flail, you rip apart this fabric. You emerge into an arched room, like a Pringles can. Person height egg cases are all around. And you have wings. Moth wings. Please remove your headphones and I'll wave you back in. Okay. Hello. Hello. Oh, um, I actually don't need you right now, I need the other two. <laughs> Why do you keep doing this to me? <laughs> Uh, I'm just gonna keep waving. waving. Double guns, dude. Double guns. <laughs> Are you calling me back in? Yes. Hey, Zero. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I thought she said to remove my headphone. Okay, if I'm waving, put your headphones back on. Hey, guys, okay. wait a second. So, I got a problem. bursting out of the cocoon without looking behind him was Zero, and then uh, Simmons saw what was in there, and you both emerged from your cocoons. Across the room, so do two other slender, insect-like figures. They look very different from you physically. You have not become Ekenblim. You've just gained wings. And these Ekenblim fan their never-before-flapped, still-wet moth wings. As they fan their wings, a green light flashes on at the entrance to this Pringles can-shaped room. Picture a long tunnel. Okay, so you guys are standing outside your cocoons. Willie's not there. Um, Zero's gonna okay. go ahead and go like... 
Where is Willie at? Are we turning into Echo Bim? What the heck is happening? I knew I shouldn't have trusted that spell. Are you okay, Simon? <laughs> um, I am nervous about this, but what are you going to do? So I think step number one, I, we can't do anything about these wings. We, we got to work on finding Willie. That's true. I mean, as long as we have the wings, we might as well use them and find out where he is. So we both popped out of these cocoons. How far away are the two cocoons that we popped out of? Like a foot behind you, unless okay. you've moved away. So, so very close. Um, like like we popped out of cocoons that were right next to each other, correct? No, you're like 30 feet apart. Okay, so he could be in any of these cocoons. Mm, do we have anything we can do to try to find him? Um. Oh, he's undead, right? Yes. Oh, no, but everything's going to be undead. I could try to use my divine sense, but... Yeah, I can blend they're not undead, at least as far as I think they they aren't. They're from a different plane. You use your divine sense? Sure. Okay, and that's a 30-foot radius. So you do sniff a willy. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and go up to the cocoon and try to rip it open. As you're walking up to that cocoon, from outside, a flying moth person is attracted to the green light. She pulls up and hovers. Oi! New hatches! They call into the room. Get your hineys out here! The other two new hatches flap their drying wings and fly outside. What do you do? Hmm. Very quickly move towards the cocoon. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going to be trying to rip open this cocoon. I'm just going to ignore that person for right now. We'll deal with her later. One last chance! Hatchlins, get over here! Did we open the cocoon yet? Oh, you're not getting over there. Okay, so I will say the two... You're making your way to it. The two newly hatched Echnoblim walk to the cavern exit, fluttering their new wet wings. The floating Echnoblim hands waiter's uniforms to the two new hatchlings. She also hands them a tray, and, testing their new wings, the newly hatched, tray-carrying, uniform-wearing Echnoblim and their boss fly away into the large, well-lit, open ballroom area beyond, where hundreds of other Echnoblim are zooming past every few seconds. You two are left in the room with person-sized cocoons. Please take your headphones off. I'll wave you back in later. Hi, Willie. Am I for sure this time? Or... <laughs> yeah. Hi, Willie. Hi. Uh, could you actually take off your headphones? <laughs> I just want to be alone. I, okay, so <laughs> listeners, I asked them how they felt about headphone removal before this game, and they all were like, I like it. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just busting balls. <laughs> all right. The bright white light with golden sprinkles fades, and you can see you are alone. You are in a tiny room, smaller than a bathroom stall, the kind, you know, it's difficult to turn around because you'll bump into it, with white wallpaper less than an arm's reach away from you in all directions. Hmm, that's not wallpaper. Do you touch it? Uh, mm, perception, or and I would like some to do some sort of check first. Okay, so you don't touch it. It's interesting, I've gotten the whole range of, I touch it, I don't touch it, I lick it, <laughs> Everyone. I want to look at this first before I just jam my hand through what I'm guessing is a gross cocoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're breathing in the air in here. The air tastes weird. It's tingly. I don't breathe. Oh, crap. Okay. <laughs> well, then this space feels weird. The <laughs> tingles are coming at you from outside your skin. You do exist. Oh, I hate this. And they're specifically targeting your back. The area where the tingles are targeting and the tingles start to condense begins to hurt a lot. And the tingles condense at that pain. You feel yourself in a moment sprout a pair of moth wings, which you no! can't open in this tiny <laughs> space. And there's something firm on your side that is not the wet squish of the walls around you. Uh, Willy, uh, <laughs> I, I have to do it for dramatically, like, goes into a full barbarian rage. Uh, once again, people have enacted magic upon his body without his consent. First time it made him dead, and now he's a freaking bug? Yeah, full, like, I start ripping at the walls. I don't care the, the firm thing. Honestly, I try to rip my wings out. Okay. First you ripped at the walls. Your arms sink oh, wait. into them. He remembers that he's supposed to be here. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Barbarian <hoops. laughs> uh, Okay, well, no, like, do it. But then he, he yeah. yeah. He's like, oh, that's right, the spell. <laughs> I feel like I haven't had my headphones off and wasn't paying attention for a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when your arms sink into the wall, they sink in like you're punching vanilla ice cream, which you can. You're very strong. And you yeah. make like a dent in them, but it doesn't like it like suckers at you, you know, like like squishy, squelchy. <sighs> Just like vanilla ice cream. <laughs> Such a sassy little ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then you remember you're supposed to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you feel something firm on your side that is not the wet squish of the walls around you. All right. Well, once he stops freaking out and uh, like reaches down and looks and touches it. It touches like a knee. A knee? Yeah. Is it connected to anything or is this just a loose knee? <laughs> yeah, you feel up. There's a hip. Okay. He puts his hand back because now it's getting in for pro. <laughs> I'm like, hey, is there somebody attached? There's no response, but there's definitely, okay. yeah. I tug to try to pull it into the bathroom stall with me. Oh, you're, you're all, you, you are in this, you could rotate and look at it, but it's behind you. Like, oh yeah, I rotate and look at it. <laughs> okay. You can hardly rotate in this narrow space, but you manage it. Ah! You said I could rotate. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. <laughs> you're like wedging yourself. There's ice cream, you know? All right. I got freaking wings now. You got wings now. Inches away from your face, eyes closed, ceramic expression still as if sleeping. This whole time, you've been backed up against the body of a dwarf that is mid-transformation into becoming Ekenblim. They're sleeping... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> They're sleeping face, not reacting to you at all, which explains why you, like, you know, when you reach behind you, you're all wedged up in this cocoon. Yeah, don't worry, you didn't touch anything. Uh, they're sleeping... Aww. Face. <laughs> yeah, um, so their skin is hardening like an exoskeleton. And a third face is also inches away, looking intently at the sleeping face, not reacting to you at all. The three of you are all so close that you're breathing in each other's exhalations. This Ew. <laughs> this Thank God I don't breathe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I wrote this for two different players. One of you breathes, one of you don't. No, it, it's not exactly planable for a dead guy to be there. <laughs> uh, it's been nothing but dreams, eyeballs, and breathing. <laughs> You can still daydream, right? You can still zone out. No, that's part of the way that Willie is the sad kind of dead guy. He doesn't oh, sleep. He well, doesn't dream. Are you immune from psychic effects? Because that's the thing. It wasn't a dream. It was oh, a psychic... get out my brain, jerk. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, no, he is not. Just for the listeners. Yeah. All right. So the three of you are all so close that you can feel their exhalation upon your skin. There we go. Adaptive DMing. I gotta get rid of the skin. <laughs> this third person has red glowing eyes, giant ram's horns, and huge folded bat wings. They aren't looking at you. They don't react to you at all. They were looking at the dwarf. They close their eyes, red glow hidden by shutting their eyelids. Must be nice eyelid. Um, I gotta make a. I gotta make a check or something. What's going on? You it's not that, looking at me. Right? Yeah. No, I think it. I think it real hard. Okay. They don't react uh, to you at all. You know what? Do I sell my items on me or am I am I new to Kazooie? You exactly teleported. You are you plus wings. Message the sleeping dwarf. So it, the spell goes directly into his brain. Oh, wait. You tried to open a second connection with that. Okay. All right. So. Well, through yeah. an item. Yes. So maybe, like, you know, it, if you're going to try to brain screw me, you know, maybe blow up my ear. I'm not. I'm not brain screwing you. But you're you gonna are... brain screw nope. listeners. <laughs> she's putting a thumbs up. She's rigging her hands together. What? She's got a screw. No, she's got a screw, listeners. She's see. putting it to her head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. But you, when you establish a connection, you can see something as if you had eyes and you had closed them and you were dreaming. But you can see a Gross. scene, like you're looking at a screen. So it's it's a psychic connection. I don't know how not eyeballed people work in vision, right? I don't know how you see, but I do know you can see this. The moment the psychic connection is established, you become aware of what the dwarf is seeing. The dwarf is sitting at a dinner table with another adult dwarf and two small dwarf children. Gross. The children are being loud and the spouse is telling them off, but it's all good natured. The red eyed devil strolls up to the table, pulls out a chair and looks at the dwarf who looks calmly back at the devil. The dwarf says, Yes, take this. Take it all. Make me perfect. You... you Willie barfs. You barf? <laughs> I'm sorry, like, that is disgusting. He's having flashbacks to being a child at the 
bottom of the ocean with the hags, making dumb deals. His poor wing. Look what happened to wing when he messed with devils. He lost all his freaking feathers. <laughs> uh, Willie fully has a physical reaction and regurgitates. You barf, and because you barf, the scene changes. Like It's like the, the connection jolts. And the scene changes to the dwarf painting at an easel. Kids running around the room, knocking over a jar of wash water that was on the floor. The dwarf sighs and bends to attend to the spilled paint water. As they bend down, you can see behind them. They bend down, and instead of revealing the wall, they reveal red eyes. Red glowing devil's eyes looking at the dwarf hungrily. The horned oh, gross eyes! <laughs> the horned head opens its mouth. As if breathing in, this whole scene is sucked into its gaping maw. Blackness. The connection is completely severed. And oh, Willie. This... Willie, like, he's going to level up after the session, but this moment, the rage he feels at what he sees, this is where he hits enough XP to level up. <laughs> okay. Why are you raging? Cuz! Stop making dumb deals! Just live your life! And if you want to do something, do it. Don't go to an outside force that's clearly malevolent. <laughs> Will, Willie's thoughts don't have a character voice. <laughs> um, he thinks a draconic, I think, is the joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I hate this. And then it, it dares to suck and use blackness as like a void. No, king of all creation. He's that he is the blackness. I am the shadows. He's aping my Batman. <laughs> Excellent. So now we have some insight into why. So when the scene disappears and the psychic connection is severed, it's you can tell when you go to message this dwarf again, it's just empty. There's nothing there. This cocoon is now drier, fluffier, flaky. It's not like ice cream anymore. Now it's like astronaut ice cream. It's a bit more spacious too. It's condensed upon itself. It was like three feet thick and now it's thinner. The devil with red eyes, giant ram's horns, and huge folded bat wings is looking satisfied at the dwarf, or the empty sh shell where the dwarf was. And it's now an ekemblem physically. The, the, what used to be a dwarf is now an ekemblem physically. There's enough space now for the devil to hold up a hand and admire the golden sphere it holds, illusory flames rising from the sphere. Inside this sphere, as you look at it, as you're examining the flames rising from it, more scenes star the children, that dwarf painting, and that spouse. Perhaps this is a soul. A soul just sucked out. Uh, can I make a quick arcana check? Because a la Little Mermaid being raised by three Ursulas. Have I seen a, a condensed soul before? Yes. Okay. I'm picturing them like the show Soul Eater. Yeah, just a, a, a yummy little Dragon Ball. Um... <laughs> Yeah, Willie uh, is now. I'm, I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna like you know. Yeah. Go to the demon. I'm like, no, screw you, man. I, I'm the soul guy. Okay. I'll treat this thing right. You're gonna. Yeah. There's all these freaking dead people out here, and nobody's even talking to them. Everybody's talking about all the undead that keep coming up. Like they're the symptom. They're this thing to be treated. No, those are people. Those bodies had souls in them, and now you're going around taking them? My soul. Mine. And then he'll barb <laughs> like, he's screaming, bellowing from his chest. <laughs> mine! Mine! Uh, I am the king of all creation! So as you reach out, do a... Your choice of check, what would this be mechanically like to reach out for something? Um, yeah, make a athletics or acrobatics check. Okay, um... I'll I'll use I'll canonically use my rage instead of stylistically in order to get advantage. I'm going to do athletics. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank Christ! Uh, dirty twenty. Okay. Ooh. Uh, That's an eighteen ooh. on the dice. But so. I was going to say, oh, yeah. shoot! I was supposed to say before it came out, I was going to use my flashback to one of my altered personas to gain me a plus D six to a skill. But can I still do it, or did it I doesn't not matter, say? Because this is an eighteen on the dice, so I don't know how much better they could have done. I was I was leaving it up to the dice. If you did well and they six, did poorly, would a you six gotten change it? it? No, no. It, it was a okay. if you did well and they did poorly, you would have gotten it. If you did poorly and they did poorly, you know, like so. It's but they did really well. Eighteen on the dice is there's not much better they could have done. So they wiggle their hands a little bit, like they just uh, tip one of their fingers up, and before. Like, you do grab it, but it's not there anymore. So you grab that space where it was, but it was already gone. 
The devil that had previously completely ignored you casually turns its head away from the newly created dwarf Ekenblim. It meets your gaze as you reach for the soul. Looking right in your eyes, you know it can see you. I look back with my empty voids. I see it too. I should replace the word eyes with pits for you. Yeah. <laughs> you right in your pits. It just sounds weird. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Is you know, it's right into my skull. Like the the smoke is my essence. That's why, like Willie's new aesthetic is all smoke because I, what I am, bleeds into the world, out right out of my vacuous eye holes. And this power was meant to use like a cudgel and subjugate people and make things bad. But no, you know what a king also does? A king protects his people. And now I'm going to kick the living, and I'm going to say it, listeners, crud out of this freaking demon. Good callback. Okay, so it speaks. <laughs> Willie. It looks you up and down. How droll. You've added a sword in the empty space where a heart would beat. Yes, I made it myself, and I don't have to go around stealing souls. Creativity that, oh, you don't possess. Everything I have is freely offered. Have uh -huh. you ever... <laughs> what? Oh, no, he's literally just going, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we... oh, yeah. <laughs> just being a dick. I won't do it for the audio, but... <laughs> have you ever wondered why you feel so empty inside, it says, judging you? Half alive, half dead, just here. Oh, honey... You have a gross misunderstanding of the situation. I know exactly what I am. I'm everybody's favorite dead boy. <laughs> Life? No, that's the thing I take away from enemies. Death? That's the thing I don't fear. Because I am what people like you made me. That's right. The hags, they gave us the fragments of your soul. Poor little half willy. Part of you here, part of you hey, with I'm a us. full willy. I'm a full willy. I'm a big boy. <laughs> and I scream, I don't need that little trinket you took from me. You wanted a king to rule all creation, and you fucking got one. No swearing on the podcast. I so had to, okay. <laughs> and you freaking got one. I had to do it. It felt too right. <laughs> um... It chuckles? <laughs> well, I do have something of yours. Mm-hmm. You can keep it, because I'm going to take your head. I, every silly mortals I, always thinking that if this body no. dies, that we die. We just respawn in hell. Baby, I know how hell works. My girlfriend is... Freaking Roxy Haypenny, and she has said multiple times while we hanging out, I'm going to ride a tank into hell and get my mother's soul back. So I have a ride to your freaking house, my dude. Keep hiding behind illusions. This soul, and he holds up his hand. I tried to snatch it again. And uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's a picture. God damn it. It's a picture. Your hand floats right. Yeah, you, <laughs> you snatch, and it floats right through. It's a picture of. You know, this soul kind of reminds you of Roxy. Willie goes dead quiet, and he can say whatever he wants. He knows. Like, he, he goes out of dead guy, cool guy mode into adventurer mode, and he needs his friends. Okay. I'm going to say this thing, because I have to say this thing, or you will I'd not say have instructions. Say the thing. Okay, all right. You know, I have, I have her soul, Roxy's mother, and I have... You're half of a soul, and you know it's pretty nice. You know, what is better than half a soul? A whole Literally soul. Literally talking to a corpse. Like, dead, no motion, <laughs> not even eyes to dart around the room. Maybe more than one. It looks off into, like at the corner of the room, just amused with itself. <laughs> Millions of souls. There is a very... It looks at you again, and it, it thinks, and it's like, just in case you hear this. There is a very high-value world that isn't letting the Ekenblim break into it. 64th floor, Hall K, row F, F. 64th floor, you've got a pen. Oh, no. Hall I assume K. you've said this to someone else, and I'm just going to kill everything in my way okay, until I find... There doesn't yeah, have no. to be an adventure today. 
Wait, no. I'll, I'll go to 64th floor, Hall K. Row FF. Row FF. Four. Figure out how to crack into that world. And I, you know, for millions of souls, that's much better than this paltry Roxy's mother's soul and your half soul. Heck, I'll give them to you if you if you figure out a way to crack into that world. And we will give you your half soul fragment back. You can be a real boy, a full yuan tea again, as if the hags had never altered you. Everyone Just wins. Literally saying nothing, no response, because, again, he has, like, this is what these types of beings do, is they offer you what they think <laughs> you want, and that's not what I want. I want to beat the, sh <laughs> the crud out of him. Yeah. I'm going to beat this thing in hell and destroy his essence. So all I have to do is get close enough to where he thinks he can reach out and I won't grab him. <laughs> so because it's not getting any response out of you, it says, well, that was a good day and a satisfying meal, but toodles. <laughs> and it like, you will remember this day for the rest <laughs> of your existence, however short it might be. And it has popped out of the cocoon, like out yeah, of existence, like nothing. There's no, there's more room in here now. All right. Hey, go eat some popcorn, you clown. And then listeners can replace that with whatever cusses they want. Okay, I'm going to wave everybody back in. Simmond cool. and Zero here. Mine! Mine! This is belongs to the soul of all, or the king of all creation. Or like, What were you shouting? What were the exact words? Uh, mine, mine, <laughs> who do you think you are? This is not your realm. I am the king of all creation. These souls are mine. Mine, <laughs> mine, mine. <laughs> you guys hear that coming from a cocoon? Um, shouting. You, really is shouting. You don't know the context. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh, I rip it open. Uh, I think you probably see a sweaty, angry, like you saw him rage like earlier. Like his muscles are like, like it's, the skin can barely contain the raw anger that is coursing through his body. Um, yeah, and Willie just looks at you like a feral beast. But he's so little. Hey, some <laughs> so people think I'm big. <laughs> Also, uh, there's but, a dwarf Ekenblim in the cocoon. Oh, yeah. That guy. Is it conscious? No. Uh, I'm going to reach in and grab Willie and pull him out. Uh, okay. These fools, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're giving up their very essence to a being that cares not for them, that plays games. They're, 64th floor, Hall K, FF. 64th floor, Hall K, FF. I'm sorry, what? 64th hall, <laughs> like babbling, like nothing. But uh, if you want to take a notes, 64th floor, hall K, uh, I think it's row FF, mm -hmm. but it, it's three things to remember. And that's what re Willie is f like foaming at the mouth, repeating to himself. Because right. it's important. <laughs> Do you know this? Because one of those hell slugs, one of those worms that crawled out of the pit and found a big enough shell to scare fools into giving up their soul, told me it offered me my soul back so I can be a real boy. But you know where he messed up? He threatened Roxy. <laughs> and like his tattoos start pulsing. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's see if we can get there. Okay. I have a feeling we should move fast. The I feel like the longer we stay here, the more Ekenblem like we're going to become. Oh, I uh, no. So, some some rules. I like to not mess with my players. Like, so there's what's called uh, DM and player implicit consent. I have not altered your character stats in any way. You have Ekenblem wings now, which will shed Ekenblem dust, but <sighs> you can cut them off and... You can fly with them. Um, and I'll just explain out of game because the, the people in the other game really, really hated them and cut them off immediately. It's a giant open flying hive. So like if you can't fly, you're screwed. So I was just like, here's some ways and a disguise because I don't want to spend time with that. I do love disguising yourself and all that, but I've, ha I've it's taken an hour in past games. Okay. So like Me Mechanically. Mechanically. Can I use... Yeah. Margaret and her climb speed to effectively be flying because really I, in character I gotta rip these freaking wings off. I just know that it's a big adventure, and they got to like a third of it last time because they weren't disguised and all that. Anyway, so I offered okay, well, it to no, you as a kind. disguise. That's all. You 
you see me start to attempt to rip my you wings You can do whatever. Out. I'm just explaining. Well, no, because... I'm, I want my players to stop me so we can keep going. But in character, go. Willie starts attempting to rip the wings out of his back, clearly to his own, like, pain and you blood. You can. You can roleplay if you're not disguised. That's what I'm saying. If you want to not be disguised, you can. I'm just offering. I want to be disguised for the difference <laughs> okay. now. Back up, DM. Zero. Get off my nut. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Zira. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Stop that. Zira's gonna go ahead and try to grab his hands and be like, we actually need these wings to blend in, especially if we want to get to whoever we need to get to, so let's just keep them on, please. Uh, Willie stops. He's foaming at the mouth. You can smell he clearly vomited recently. <laughs> oh, cute. <laughs> uh, he was in a, he's in a full fervor. He goes, blend in with what? A bunch of soul-sucking leeches and he'll he quiets up and kind of calms down zero is gonna be like exactly and we're gonna have to find you a bathroom as well for your breath. <laughs> I, got, I, I, I freaking i saw this demon taking the soul right out of the guy and then i saw memories and this guy had a whole wife and children and all that he gave up so he can be Perfect, and he motions back to the half dwarf, half bug on the table in the cocoon. Do we That's need to kill perfection. it? Perfection? No, it doesn't deserve death. Oh, Willie okay. has trauma connected to soul stuff. <laughs> That's why we're doing this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Just so everyone's clear. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, you mentioned a specific location. Should we try to find it? Yes, and. All right, let's yeah. try out this flying thing. I think we know how this went last time, so let's practice. Yeah, you guys were really bad at it. <laughs> All right, Willie, you're first. Show us how it's done. Oh, come on, please. I've never wanted a low dice roll more in my life. <laughs> it's a it's a two. It's a nat two on the dice. <laughs> you barrel into a cocoon and send it flying into a wall. Yeah, I've clearly damaged my wings to some degree. <laughs> Almost if you had a hurt foot, as it were. Oh, this is a great um, time to uh, explore this. The injury on the wing slowly heals over time. Um, you would say it's unusual. Not everybody regenerates like this. Willie does. But I do. <laughs> yeah. And the wings, although they, like, you could even, one could say, one could extrapolate... An Ekenblim could take lethal damage and recover from it. Mm. This this wing is healing like way like it like shattered and broke off like maybe or crumpled or something and it heals. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, unusual. I try to get like I point my back at my uh, my two friends and then like rip open a big gash in my leg. Is there a notable difference as like black shadow stuff stitches my leg together <laughs> yeah, not... between the way yeah. I heal on my leg and the wings on the back? Is this separate magic? <laughs> I stab my wings. Gold dust, gold dust. Uh, yeah, they look different. <laughs> Wild. Zero is just face palming at everything that's happening right now. <laughs> Not even really knowing how to react. Uh, but that's good to know, because this is, like, fully separate magic. It's not, like, totally ingrained in us. Otherwise, I would heal gold dust for that. I'm not crazy. I'm getting looks. <laughs> <laughs> Zero's like, uh, let's... well, it's good to know that we are not... Actively turning into Ecloblem, good lord. But we could have picked a better word. Yeah. After, <laughs> after, well, after Zero says that, you all pass your passive perception checks. Loud voices are approaching from outside this cavern filled with person height cocoons that is shaped like a Pringle can. Um, so, like, it's a long tube filled with person height cocoons loud voices are approaching from outside this cavern filled with person height cocoons arguing with one another what do you all do uh listen or go up to the 64th floor what's the move gang there's one exit to this pringles can and people are there and they're arguing and they're coming towards the room i hide behind the edge of the door so i'm out of view willie follows suit Zero is going to be just thinking the hat's back on, so he's just going to stand there for a minute and just be in sight. <laughs> oh, the freeze? Uh, freeze, but... Okay, yeah, it's like dark, he's going to so... be a little frozen. Honestly, freezing in a dark room is not an invalid hiding strategy because it, it's not like this is a well-lit area. The well-lit area is beyond the end of this tunnel in the center. So everyone roll a stealth check. Uh, Zero's was a little bit involuntary, but freezing is valid, yeah. Got a 13. 
Mm-hmm. Minus one. Mm-hmm. Twelve. Thirteen. Go down the It would be so good if we both actively hid and <laughs> Zero still does better. <laughs> Hold on, I'm sorry, this website. Okay. Um Okay. Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to roll for them. Yeah, they got an eight. Okay. A grasshopper Ekenblim is shouting at an eagle-headed, gray horse-bodied Ekenblim. Anybody recognize them? Okay, so a grasshopper Ekenblim is shouting at an eagle-headed, gray horse-bodied Ekenblim. We see Queen gone and STL temporarily in power. We can't afford to have anything go wrong. The light only knows what she would say if she gets back from her date and finds out we had intruders. The two are hovering near the entrance, getting closer and closer to this cavern filled with quiet cocoons. So sorry, so sorry, my lord, says the eagle-headed, horse-bodied Ekenblim. He enters the Pringles can-shaped room with the cocoons and fails his perception check. (laughs) Uh, He takes advantage of the ground available in this room to land and prostrate himself. Bowing so low, his beak is touching the cave floor. His muffled voice rises up. I will have C-Tier West direct all of their defensive Apple Finch teams to floor 173 immediately. There will not be any further interruption. And I'll read that again in a not muffled voice. I will have C Tier West direct all of their defensive Apple Finch teams to floor 173 immediately. There will not be any further interruption. He remains uh, bowed. The grasshopper Ekimblim raises her lip in a sneer. I have to return to my work on the 64th floor. See to it that the intruders are dealt with before the queen returns. All your rapid rise to BTR will become just as rapid a descent. The grasshopper Ekenblim flies off, and after a long pause, the hippogriff Ekenblim, Elios von Hoofen stuff, sighs, <gasps> Helios <laughs> rises and flies off as well. <laughs> oh man, um, I, I like very quietly say to Simmond, "Their whole world is so silly." And with that, that. we're going to go to break. Joining us this time were... Zero. Hey, everyone. Simmond. Hey. And Willie. Hello. We've got a review for you. We do. So Flygon24 said that Simmond's singing was so good in the last game, the killer desserts weren't the only thing they wanted to eat. (laughs) Wow. Spicy review. We like spice. Oh man, and we love reading them. Yeah, so leave like us... if it, yeah, take it over, Dion. Leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll read it on air. Bye. Take a break. Bye. <laughs> we hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Fire Breathing Kittens podcast. This episode's shout out is from Thick and Crispy, who says, "Quote: I bet you won't read this on air." Fixture. Tropical. Organize. Breakfast. Unity. End quote. Yes, we really did read that on air. Can you think of someone who might enjoy this podcast? Please share it with them. Is their birthday coming up? A special day? We can wish them a happy message on your behalf. You can arrange for us to read your shout out on air at firebreathingkittenspodcast.com through our partnership with the website Buy Me a Coffee. Do you enjoy reading books? You can find ebooks, paperbacks, and hardcover novels based on our adventures on Amazon.com. And audiobooks, too. We're on Audible. The authors do a great job of adapting the stories into fun novels. We also have official merchandise on Redbubble.com. Imagine owning a notebook with the Fire Breathing Kittens logo on the front. Or one of your favorite characters on a t-shirt. Lastly, we don't pay to advertise this show, so the only way we can grow is if you tell somebody about us. Can you think of someone who might enjoy that episode that you enjoyed? Would it make them smile? Share it with them. Thank you. Welcome back to Fire Breathing Kittens, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons podcast. We are joined again by... Willie. Hello. 
<laughs> we made you all happy over the brakes. You got to get back to being angry again, is what you said just before. Oh, you... no, I'm mad. I hate the Echo Bloom. They're so bad. They're bad people. They're, they're not even bad people. They're bad bugs. We've got bad bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Simon the Kind. Hi. <laughs> I don't know. And, and Zero. Hey, everyone. All right. Rather than you guys telling me what, or and the listener what happened last time, you guys can probably tell each other what all happened. So I'm just going to release you to talk. Go ahead. What happened? Well, we got transported over here to the Ekemblem Hive, and <clears throat> Zero and I here hopped out pretty quick and found that we're ourselves, but with Ekemblem wings. But Willie was in there for a good long time. Hey, Willie, what were you doing in there? Uh, no, straight up, dude. Demon. Just a big, traditional, horned, scary demon. The dude was getting echoblimified. The echoblimification process had begun. And he just plucked his soul right out of his chest. It looked like a little dragon ball. And, and trust me, I've seen souls before. I, I, I'm supposed to, I was supposed to trade in souls. So it's like something really bad. They're not just turning into bugs. It's not a, a sort of malaise that create, makes Echoblim non-creative. They're truly losing something and someone else is getting it. And that is bad. So that's what I was doing in there. I watched a freaking dwarf's whole life. He had a wife and kids. Okay. He doesn't anymore. Well, that's the messed up part, man. He does. And they're out there loving and missing their father, who now could not give a passing glance at them at a biological level. He is incapable of loving his children now. So essentially what you're saying is that when you become an Ekemblem, you actually lose your soul. Yeah, in... I thought it was just like weird spell magic, but you're actually losing your soul. Hmm. And I don't know if you've ever dropped a pie and then tried to put the pie back in the pie tin. Souls don't just pop back in. Okay. So this is serious. That's a very interesting analogy. <laughs> I drop a lot of pies. <laughs> <laughs> I would still eat the pie. <laughs> Thank I would Thank not. You. I reach out. I, I hug uh, some of the kind. <laughs> Thank you. You're so big. I'm a giant dude, so it's a lot to be able to be smaller than someone. I try to Hulk, Hulk, Hulk v. Hulk you a little bit, but then I go back to crying. I would say you're like, you're, you're tall, but aren't you very, very skinny? Yeah, but it's tightly coiled muscle. And then when I rage out, I fill out. Sure it is, honey. Okay. <laughs> I take it. <laughs> I'm not going to look into it. Uh, but yeah, so we're having a weird day. We're, we're here... Like, just to realign our goals, we were here to observe the echoblimification process because Rooney's sister, who thinks she's so freaking cool, gave us the mission. So we're here, we're in disguise, and then I saw this demon. I, I was so angry I forgot why, but he told me to go to this specific location. So I'll remind you, there's a very high-value world that isn't letting the echoblim break into it. Figure out how to crack into that world, and they'll give you... Roxy's mom's soul and your soul, your half soul back, your ear split. And they witnessed something. You guys want to tell Willie what you saw? We saw some other new Ekemblems hatched and they got pulled out and turned into waiters. Um, kind of like we did in that dream. And then there were some other people coming who were coming to look for intruders. Um, but th I think the intruders were on C tier West floor 173. Yes, I also took note of that. Do you think... Well, I wonder who the intruders are. Cause we're Was it in, intruders, or were they preventing people from going there to intrude? I, I think it was a... They got in, and they're like, it won't happen again. We'll tighten defenses. Do we know what floor we're on? Oh, we don't. Well, uh, no windows in this Pringle can, Dan? There's just one way out. The end of the Pringle can is a bright golden light. There's a ballroom past it. You poke your head out of your Pringles can shaped cave that had been full of cocoons. You are inside a beehive whose core is open and airy. 
and arches 100, 200 floors high. The air is filled with the full hum of a lot of wings. The wings sound like thousands of people are talking all at once. Along the walls going up, there are many rooms. High arches, wide walkways. This is reminiscent of a beehive, but finely worked out of all the same material, a beautiful and hard substance. Fresco paintings cover every inch of the walls, carved into very stoic, but undeniably beautiful art. Stoic like the Mona Lisa. This is a hive palace. At the very top dome is a bright light glowy area. Directly across the open core from you, a cavern has a clear floor raised over rings of gold dust, a convenient portal area. Hundreds of Ekenblim are flitting around, flying on their moth wings through the center core, gold dust vortexing after each wing beat, shimmering in the air. The bottomest floor on the ground has fighting pits that don't seem to be occupied right now. Uh, Willie's really mad because it is beautiful, but these these are bad bugs. And so he's just, he's angry that something so pretty could be so mean. Okay. But uh, he's wild, so you guys take lead. He, he's too, otherwise he's just going to start punching bugs. Um, <laughs> Willie the fly swatter. Yeah. <laughs> Zero, what do you think? We've got two leads, 64 and 173. Which do you think we should follow up on first? I feel like we should go for 64 first, just because that's what Willie had in his dreams, and it feels like that might be the source and where the queen could potentially be. All right, 173, let's go. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Either or... We're going to find somebody some way. If we make enough ruckus, we'll get the queen's attention. That's for sure. All right. Um, I'm going to try to fly. Okay. You successfully fly. I'm not going to punish you. You can fly. All right. I can fly. Um, I'm going to just examine the opening into this like open air hallway kind of thing. Do I, do I see like a number or anything there... like on the room that we were on? Right. So the room that you're on is darker on the inside than this bright open air space, the core. Mm -hmm. And looking all around the core, there are lots of these hexagonal shaped rooms or round, you know, they're in rows. The bottom mm -hmm. ground floor has a row, then a row above it. If you were to count, you can count all the way up to 200. Gotcha. But they're not labeled. No, but it's like being in a hotel where you can see the floors up on the interior of a, of a very large hotel. Mm -hmm. All right. I am going to count from the bottom to 64. You can see it. All right, and I'm going to go there. Okay, so you fly out into the ballroom. Sure. Okay, everyone else? Of course. I'm flying out into the ballroom. An Ekenblim, who had been hovering near your cave, is holding butler and maid outfits, and reaches their hand out to you with outfits, and says, Hatchlands, get over here! Come on, come on, get changed, hurry up! You's got a job to do. Let's start you ferrying trays of food. Behind her, sure. fresco paintings covering every inch of the walls is a ballroom inside a beehive. Do you accept the server's uniform and tray of canapes? I do. I mean, yeah, I revel on the. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but yes. And of course, mm -hmm. I put on a maid outfit. <laughs> I'm assuming traditional French maid. Oh, yeah. Okay. I accept it. All right. With a lot of spite in my heart, but I accept it. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> I had one assignment for this adventure, and that was to demonstrate the enforced social hierarchy, which sucks more because you guys are theoretically immortal and stuck like this forever. All right, so floor 64. Oh, you don't work your way up? The aristocrats aren't just the oldest Ekemblem? No, there is no upward mobility in Ekemblem society. <laughs> They're like, hey, you can come be a beautiful bug forever. And you're like, yeah, that sounds great. I get to hang out in a big palace. And they're like, yeah, and bring me food. <laughs> what makes the aristocratic Ekenblem aristocrats? How well uh, they serve the queen. That, uh, yeah. So there has to be some upward mobility because the good servers became aristocrats. Mm. Mm, I would listen to the episode. Uh, was it Granny and Sword? Sword uh, and Granny, yes. Yeah, sword and Granny. Oh, dude, I don't know. I can look it up. Yeah. 
Well, uh, long story short, a little, you know, care. this is something Willie doesn't know, but I do as a player. There was a hive of bugs that got Teenage Mutant, Mutant Ninja Turtle styled covered in magic ooze. And then those bugs became the Echo Blim, immortal mm-hmm. and always. And they have been the Echo Blim forever. And the reason there's more is because they go to other places and turn people into Echo Blim to serve them and keep them entertained. Because they're bugs, and they have a very short attention span. (laughs) These are bugs that got too powerful and too sexy, and now people think that they're cool. Is this um, person still right in front of us? No. When you accepted, they flew off. They've got other things to do. You're so not worth their attention. You're completely disguised. Do we know the general direction we're supposed to go, though? You can see just... floor 64, yeah, for sure. You can count, yeah. Um, and the 64th floor. All right, so I'll take you there. Oh, God, I'm so ingrained with, like, service industry work that I'm like, no, I mean, like, where where do I need to go bring the food to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm taking the food to floor 64. <laughs> yeah, I start doing the job, and then you're like, no, we're, we're adventurers. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So you're, you're poking your head into caverns. You see one that's empty and shallow. Poking your head around, counting. 63, 65. The one in this cavern, it's a shallow cavern, maybe like 15 feet deep, and it's got a relief on the back wall. It depicts moth-winged people bowing down, kneeling and raising their arms in praise to... Now this might be hard to interpret. You never know with art, but... It looks like they're worshipping a giant severed finger? That's a bit odd. Is that the light that was mentioned? Which, by the way, I found it very funny that the bug people, their god is is a light. (laughs) One of the best things I've ever done, to be honest. (laughs) Okay, so you find 64. You find 64. The 64th floor is different. Oh, the light is literally the chandelier at the top. Anyway. Oh. So the 64th floor is different from the cavern with all the cocoons. Different from the fighting pits on the bottom level. Different from the open-air ballroom in the core of this beehive. This 64th floor has the atmosphere of a workplace. You're flying, but you're flying past shoulder-height, hexagonal work areas that, despite being constructed of this unusual hard material and covered in frescoes of stoic art, could only be described as cubicles. Oh, gross. I (laughs) hate these bugs. (laughs) Hall after hall, each hall filled with row after row, hundreds of Ekenblim are engaged in office work, sitting waving their hands at what you think might be illusion screens. Each illusion screen has a different picture in it. A forest, a desert, an ocean. They're all scrolling around unoccupied wilderness looking at the worlds they're seeing on their screens, searching for something. Oh, bros, I cast my message earrings. When I was hanging out with that dope chick Rooney and Stella, we went in this forest and we saw what could only be described as an observation station. And then I motioned towards these view screens of different worlds that these Echo Blim are observing. What are they looking for? places to invade beautiful things i motion towards like the crystal chandelier the frescoes on the wall something pretty okay that makes sense um all right um we're looking for hull k are they lettered do i kind of look around for signs yes you find hulls e f g h i j a hull k all right i'm gonna proceed quickly down that hall looking for room ff Okay. Strict hierarchies demand that the more senior managers get larger offices. The closer you get to Hall K, the fewer hexagonal cubicles you see. At first, there are offices walled in from floor to ceiling. Then, office suites, with a welcome lobby and an interior office, you know, like a secretary, maybe. By the time you reach Hall K, row FF, The office suites have become incredibly luxurious, each person getting a private mansion. Zen gardens of alien glowing mushrooms give this a palatial atmosphere. It's quiet, 
with just the sound of running water from a decorative stream. Imagine the house falling water by the architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Serene, majestic, <laughs> they, high class. They didn't, get, they didn't get Frank Lloyd Wright, did they? they tell me they didn't <laughs> echo with a five Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> no. No, his life was oh, wild. Uh, anyway, no. <laughs> Uh, okay. Not everybody's seen the house. It's a house that's built over a waterfall. So, like, the water's crashing down as your front yard, you know? And there's, like, a. It's, it's huge. It's got, like, maybe, I don't know. This one has 6,000 square feet on the entry level, you know, like, pine wood floors, back wall made of glass looking out over the forests and the, the river. And then, like, you know, beautiful stone built into the walls. Very natural looking. Super best office. <laughs> yeah, Willie is walking towards it or flying or whatever and mutters under his breath. Palace of skulls. Azira is just following along with everyone. Um, Simmons is still looking. I mean, we've, we're in Hall K. We found row FF, but we don't have any idea which... Uh, there's multiple mansions within the row FF, mm -hmm. correct? At it's this just point, each row is a mansion and this is definitely the place. All right, let's go in. Can we get in? Oh, trust me, we can get in. And he like revs up an Eldrick blast. Simmons stands back eating the pastries from his tray. Uh, do we think it's a good idea if we just blow this place up or should we knock first? No, we definitely knock first, but if we can't get in, and I, I do the hand motions again for Eldrick blast. Okay, Zero's going to go ahead and go to the door and knock on it, wherever that may be, if there is a door. When you knock on the door, it clicks unlocked and someone calls, oh, come in, like they're busy. You can set it down there. Oh, sorry, they have a character voice. <clears throat> come in, you can set it down there. Oh, You have a lot of character voices this episode. I'm yeah. trying. DM putting in work. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, you're getting your you're you're in your money today. <laughs> well, two cents. Zero's gonna go ahead and walk through the door and just look around to see what's happening. You step inside, or or you see it, the door's open. It's fine. This is a very like low security sort of response, you know. Inside, picture a rectangle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's longer than it is wide. It's all open floor plan, you know, like mm -hmm. architects. And on the left, there's a kitchen with an island. And there's like a divider wall, so you can't see behind that. Um, now, you don't know this, but I'll just tell you, because you can imagine the room, is a recessed flooring seating area where, like, you go to sit down and, like, you, your feet can go down a little bit. So fancy. I hate how dope they are. <laughs> The only wall is the one that divides the kitchen from the sitting area, but it doesn't go all the way across. And on the right, you can see all the way back to the, a wall of windows that looks out over the alien Zen garden that I'm, I'm picturing like uh, falling waters, I think is like a, a normal deciduous trees biotope. And you can see the red autumn leaves and, and the river. And it's like the alien version of that, where it's very beautiful, very pristine nature. And the mm -hmm. floor to ceiling windows look out. There's a bit of a deck, so you can enjoy that space. Uh, the door to the deck is open, and there's a bit of a, a nice breeze coming in. And the the desk of this worker is looking out over that, out to that view, facing that view with their back towards the front door and you. They have uh, silvery blue hair. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that got a reaction. Why? Well, yeah, I wasn't there. Um, I just want like well, it was the Why? like facing the window, which I'm like, oh god, it would be so easy just to squash this bug. Why? Okay, Zero is gonna go ahead and walk up and touch their shoulder. You're walking up to them. You're walking up to an elegantly dressed Ekenblim wearing a mage clothing with gold and blue hues, sitting at an illusion screen. You think maybe. Maybe it's a portal. Beyond him, a wall of glass looking out at an alien garden and waterfall. His hand raised to scroll in on the illusion screen, viewing a futuristic city. He turns to you, silver blue hair swaying with the motion, light brown skin encompassing passionate green eyes. Zero? My love, you've returned to me. His face lights up with joy. 
Zero is gonna look in complete shock, not even a thought or word out of his mouth, just standing there like, what is going on? He's gonna rise from his seat and embrace you, or try to. Zero is gonna definitely push him away. When you push him away, he looks confused at you, and he says, You, you knew I, I lived, right? You were just breaking up with me, that, but you've come back. It, but you didn't actually want to kill me, right? Oh, bro, just shock-faced at Simmond. Willie's like, whoa. <laughs> Should we give them a moment? Yeah, no, I want to watch. <laughs> Zero is going to go ahead. I don't think it's that kind of podcast. And just move his oh, hand towards... No, one of them's going to kill the other one. <laughs> his blade. <laughs> and... My love, no. No, we're, we can be together. No, I definitely meant to kill you. You were trying to destroy the entire village and kill everybody. Like, you did not deserve to live. They did not deserve to live. <laughs> I'm slapping Simmons' chest going, See, I told you, I told you! <laughs> they did not deserve to live. They treated me terribly. They treated you terribly. I, I became this S-tiered Ekimblim for a reason. I gave my queen the world of Guasso. She deserves... <gasps> You, yes. You, you <laughs> bad man. <laughs> she deserves all the worlds, he says to your friends. And you, people are awful. When they have free will, they make terrible choices. They prey on the weak. They hurt one another. They're much better off with her making their choices for them. Don't you see? She's our queen now. She's out now, but when she gets back, she'll she'll love this present. And and he gestures towards the screen. She's what's best for Guasso. I look up at the screen. Oh, sorry. I was going to be like, I look up at the screen to see what they were gesturing towards. You know his name. What's okay. his name? Um, Sarian. Sarian was gesturing towards a, a... You see now the glittering gold edge to this. It's not an illusion. It's a portal. It's looking at a futuristic city. Spires of well-occupied spaces similar to a skyscraper futuristic airboats you're not even sure what to describe them as and i want you and simon to take off your headphones zero what okay <laughs> <laughs> really make a perception check uh tw i think it's a 23 but definitely over 20 yeah it's pretty high yeah because uh, everything you do is eyeball based <laughs> 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 i know my dm <laughs> Examine no. himself. Um, anyway, so you're not sure why this Ekenblim man can't tell, but you with your curse magic can magically sense. There you go. It's not just I... pit sensing. <laughs> My pit sense, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can magically sense. The city on the screen has a little flying boat constantly cutting a chink out of the circle of dust. If you took that boat out, if you took it down, if you incapacitated it, the teleportation circle could complete. It's flying around and around, cutting a gap in the circle every few seconds, blocking the glitter from forming a complete ring. Like a defense system this world has against invasion. Can his Ekenblim eyes not see it? See, you... He thinks to himself, you fool. You fool. You still have eyes. <laughs> I have evolved beyond eyes. <laughs> um, can I message the boat? Uh, no, because the portal is not complete. Um, so it's not the connection's okay. not there. Yeah. Um, <clears> and <throat> but I just remind you, if you make this connection complete, and the Ekenblim are able to invade this high populated world, that's what value is, soul count. Then the devil will give you your half soul and uh, her mom's soul back. But Anyway, I just wanted to let you know you're the only one with this information. If you don't tell it to your fellow players, they won't have it. Are you ready? Okay. Anything um, you want to say? Can I do one yeah. quick thing before we go back? Yeah. Can I call Roxy? Yeah. Like, using, yeah. like, mental, like, I'm not going to, like, move or do anything, but I'll just, like, you know. Boo, 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 boo. Yeah, yeah. I got to put my resting cat face on. Okay. I'm ready to be snarky. Hey, Rox. <laughs> um, you. <laughs> you know who it is. Uh... I've been the Yosekai, and there's a whole a bunch more demon nonsense. Um, I can, like, totally ruin a whole world 
to get your mom's soul back, but I just, that's, that's not your vibe, right? Like, you want to go in there and carve it out yourself, carve a bloody path, maybe have a powerful warrior by your side. Willie, please, I don't need you to destroy a world. I can do this myself. I'm going to ride this tank into battle, whether or not you're with me. I love to hear from you. Uh, I got to go do adventure stuff. And I got to very quickly call it, close the connection. And uh, yeah, I'm going to let the boat do its work. This, f- The Equiblim can go eat an egg. <laughs> All right, let's wave your fellow players back in. A uh, message spell to you guys. I okay. think that will be my last one, my last two uses out of my five. The the future world has a tiny little boat that's preventing the the, the portal from being completed, uh, which is good for us. And the Echo Bloom can't seem to notice. Uh, so let's distract him, try to make contact with the boat, and then if we can figure out how they do it, you know, we can do it to other worlds, and the Echo Blooms can go eat an egg. Okay. So just to clarify, we want to distract Syrian. Yeah. <laughs> I, that sounds I, just, like I don't things. know if there's okay. anything that would distract him at this moment. <laughs> oh, I, I I got a few ideas. Um, so Zero's going to turn to Zirian, look into him, into his beautiful green eyes, his majestic, you know, just tree-colored green eyes, tree-leaf-colored green eyes. Trees are brown. Um, <laughs> Truer words, man. Trees are brown. And just ask him, so how did you, how did you get to this point? What happened after the village? I was proving my loyalty the whole, the whole time. I'd do anything for the queen because people don't deserve free will. They don't. They suck. They, they picked on me. They picked on my mom. They, they made us feel like we weren't worthy of just even existing because we were poor because she, you know, didn't know who my father was this is this everything you see everything i am is because of all the trauma that they gave me i'm only a product of what they turned me into and what i gave them back was what they deserved and honestly everybody's better off with the queen making their decisions for them it's beautiful here but but wasn't your goal to gain enough power that you could make whatever decisions you wanted to and that we could be forever together and immortal together. We can't be immortal together like this. What if the queen doesn't allow us to be together because she wills it? Are you okay with that? One of his personality traits is that he will say anything you want to hear. Yep. <laughs> Do an insight check right now as he says to you, Of, of course we can. I know the queen. Don't you trust me? You trusted me once. Insight check. While they're talking. 25. Can me and Simon be Scooby-Dooing over to the desk? Yes. You were distracting okay. sufficiently. Simon and Willie are over at the desk. Um, and I'm just thinking, like, as they're talking, you're slowly stepping <laughs> back, and he's closing the gap, and then we're just filling in behind. Yeah, Syrian's following you across the floor, away from the window in the deck. I'm going to shield um, Willie from view just by standing in front of him. I am a great deal wider than he is. (laughs) So I can just, I should be able to completely block all view of him, whatever he's doing at the computer. Yeah. All right. So, you know. My plan is insane, just so you know. (laughs) I'm prepared. Zero, you know that he said, we can trust the queen. And your insight check tells you, what's his tell? If you were playing poker, how do you know that he's lying? Slight eye movement. You see it? Okay. What do you say out loud back? After I see that he's lying? Hmm. We're trying to distract some people, so let me see. I'm going to go ahead and be like, Oh, really? That's awesome to hear. So how do you become an Echo Bloom? Don't worry about the details. I thought you trusted me, right? Don't you trust me? Of course I trust you. Do you trust me? I want you friends to make a stealth check. I am so here for the drama. Like, Willie is, he's, he knows he's here for some, like, business, but he's, like, glancing over his shoulder. Like, I just want to watch it so bad. Um, Stealth check is 13. (laughs) That's a flat 10 for a Will. Uh, Like I said, 
I'm just, I'm being a door. I am just standing here <laughs> blocking the view. I, 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 my very mediocre stealth check is because I keep trying to peer around Simon to watch the thing happening. <laughs> he sees your friends. He glances over your shoulder. He knows what you're here for. And he steps in close to your face, raises a hand to your cheek and whispers in and smiles and says, Do not trust people like me. I will take you to museums and parks and monuments and kiss you in every beautiful place so that you can never go back to them without tasting me like blood in your mouth. I will destroy you in the most beautiful way possible, and when I leave, you will finally understand why storms are named after people. And he turns around, and I'm sorry, Simmond and Willie, but he's going to do an attack on you. Perfect. So I'm going to roll can I tell you my... attacks. Yes, yes. Can I tell you my insane plan? Did you like the thing that I stole from Reddit? And when I, I leave, you will finally understand why storms are named after people. <laughs> that was pretty good. No, the, the I'll kiss you in every beautiful place and leave you like blood in your mouth. That was the high point. That was, I was like, damn, I kind of want to hook up with this guy. Uh, Willie, uh, his plan was to write a message to this faraway world on his finger. Hoping oh no. that space is relative. <laughs> He's been wanting to do it all season. <laughs> Slices off his own finger, throws it through what we now know is a portal. <laughs> and hoping that size changes a giant finger with a message that says, You have friends in Guasso, the Echoblin must be stopped, your efforts are valid. Hi, my name's Willie. <laughs> like, I've written it like, uh, you know, as we were watching, I was scribbling on my index finger. And then as he moves to attack, I real quickly slash and then toss it through the portal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> fantastic um <laughs> at least this one doesn't explode into a bunch of infectious golden dust <laughs> no it's just my creepy shadow magic yeah <laughs> hope you had shadow magic in this world otherwise now all your shadows are alive anyway so <laughs> hey all that's my problem to deal with we're dealing with the echo blim first okay magic the gathering we got to deal with the stack okay <laughs> first in the initiative in priority yeah all right uh you're not uh, so you're passing priority to me <laughs> magic term so um yeah so we're gonna see who he attacks because he's going to look over one two three for simon four five six for willie that was a six all right syrian points at one creature it can see within 300 feet of it please make a wisdom saving throw mm -hmm. uh am i within 10 feet of zero no ah all right i gotta use my own bonus then <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. And in. <laughs> yeah, right. This was one better, though. <laughs> um, 18 on the dice, plus 5 is a 23, and my wisdom is a flat... Oh, I, I think I factored it in. 7, so that would be 25. Okay, it makes sense that you pass because your blood doesn't flow, as you have an aneurysm. Zero knows that Syrian has blood magic. Oh, your eyes just widened. I wish it was conveyed to the listener. All right, so you're not frightened. You passed. You only take 26 necrotic damage. Ah! I'm resistant to necrotic damage because I turned my hag tattoos into a life bloom tattoo. So okay. I only take half of that. Nice. Yeah. He just it, tried to blood curse me? <laughs> Will Velian von Erden? Do you know who you are messing with? Everybody, please roll initiative. I got a 19. Me as well. My dex is only plus one, though. Four. What? Okay, what's your modifier to dex? Zero. Negative one, so 18. Okay, so that means it's Willy, then zero, then Syrian, and then Simmond, who got a four. Okay. Everybody, please pre-roll your combat. I'm going to describe the room. We're going to do linear combat because two dimensions are hard. And so I'm going to say that Willy... Let's describe the room. So Willy and Simmond are together at the same point. Instead of doing three dimensions, where one is standing behind and one is standing in front, just doing two dimensions. So you're at the same point in length. Yeah. So Willie and Simmond, you're standing at, basically like if you're teleworking at the computer office, right? Uh, you're standing there, which I'm gonna put at the end of the room. Let's say that you're 30 feet from that open door out to the deck. Okay, so 30 feet to the deck, zero, you were walking across the room, and you got 70 feet away. 
And you and Syrian are within five feet of one another. Okay. So Syrian and Zero are 70 feet away from Willie and Simmond, who are 30 feet away from the deck. Okay? After Syrian Simmond, you are next. You have a chance to react. You are okay. 70 feet from Syrian. How far could a dagger be thrown? The dagger, give me a sec, it has stats. It's with disadvantage at a certain range and without disadvantage at a certain range. So give me a sec. Dagger, 5e. But you I should say. write this down on your weapon in the future because it's, it's genuinely like a thing that it comes with. Okay, so it says 20 feet without disadvantage, 60 feet with disadvantage. So you cannot, you would know with I'd the properties of your weapon that you cannot hit it from where you are. Yeah, I'd have to move. And even so, I would have disadvantage. Let me see if I can still hit with disadvantage. Let's all take a, te- take a second, pre-roll everything. And then when okay. you're ready, everyone gives a thumbs up when you're ready. Okay. Oh, my, my, mine was already pre-rolled. I just didn't know about the disadvantage. I didn't know I was that far away. Um, so I'm going to move 30 feet uh, towards Syrian um, so that I am now within that 60 feet of the dagger throw. Uh, my original roll was a 16 plus 8, so 24. And I actually rolled a nat 20 for the second. So I would take the disadvantage was still the 24 to hit. With a dagger? How much damage is that? Oh, not much. Um, But this is the Dagger of Love and Hate. Remember that one? Nope. What does it do? Read it. Uh, uh, So what it does, this might be a homebrew item. I got it very early in the game and I've never used it. Um, It gives a 50% chance of making the character hate me and a 50% chance of making them be charmed on a saving throw wisdom. Did I make up that item? I, I maybe I don't remember who made it. It smells like me. <laughs> I have bad news for you regarding love and this person. What? You can't love. He's fully in love with Zero, and it's not going to stop him from killing him. I mean that. This is Syrian. This isn't a random monster. So he could love you. He could hate you. It doesn't affect who he kills. It's kind of why he's terrifying. Like so. Does yes, that... it succeeds, and he loves you too. And now this is bad. <laughs> Does that not does that change the mechanics of the charm spell? I think it would be mechanically Echolin are probably immune to charm. Yeah, because oh. they're fairies, right? Yeah, and then it's flavored as, you know, he doesn't care about love. But these are effectively fairies. They can't love. Well poop. So yeah. the, the, the guys their soul got sucked out by a devil. They don't love their family anymore. They don't I mean they never really loved But Zero's right. so cool. It has to be stronger when it's zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it has to be a humanoid within range, wisdom saving throw. Um, immune to charm. Sorry. Yeah, immune to charm. So, yeah, yeah if, if they're immune, then it doesn't matter. So, this is, it deals seven damage. Okay. Is it magical? It is. Okay. 297 goes down to 290. Yay. An attempt was made. And that was your action. You threw a dagger. I would say I'll give you the insight since you did spend your whole turn doing that. You moved and you attacked. Uh, that it looks like this is not a normal person you fought. You'd say 290 is a, is a bunch of hit points. See, guys, ready for a hard battle? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you have yeah. two high level paladins, I think. Yeah, it should be okay. <laughs> I've scattered this a, a little hard. Just to clarify, uh, yeah. Because I do think I was first initiative. Not in melee range on the first turn. You are 70 feet away from Syrian. Mm, okay. Cool. Yeah, and it's your turn because that's the end of Simmons unless you do a bonus action. How tall is this room? Mm, 20 feet high. Okay. All right. But uh, we're fighting in two dimensions. Two. Oh, I know. Yeah. It, it affects some of my abilities. Okay. All right. Uh, are you done with your turn? Yes. Please pre-roll and have ready so we don't have to wait on anybody's dice. Oh, yeah. Willie, you are 70 feet away from Syrian and Zero. Syrian's doing this thing where he's, like, touching the side of Zero's face, and Zero looks repulsed and horrified because he just gave that line where I'm going to take you to beautiful places so that you taste me like blood in your mouth when you visit them again. Uh, mm-hmm. All right, what do you do, Willie? Uh, well, uh, bone. okay, so movement action, just getting a flat uh, 30 feet closer. Um, main action, casting an Eldric Blast. Uh, I got two of them. Lowest was a 16. 
Just to let you guys know, the armor class is 14 for Syrian. Cool. So two hits for a total of uh, only 14 damage. But what quick type? question. Uh, force. Yeah. My Eldritch Blast, I have an invocation that pulls the target 10 feet closer on an Eldritch Blast. Because I have two beams, 10 feet or 20 feet? I don't care. 20 works for me. Cool. That puts me next turn. I can do a melee action, you know, e- even because we have wings. Like, I know it's three dimensional fight, but I'm just getting them closer and going straight at them. Uh, and then bonus action, Hexblade Curse. What's that do? Uh, crit on a 19. I do my charisma as extra damage and, uh, or sorry, no, a proficiency bonus as extra damage. Uh, and that, that's it. So I crit on a 19, basically. That's the big juice. All right. So you, to describe what happened, you shot beams at him and pulled him forwards? Yeah, like I'm running at him full (laughs) charge. Like I jump off to like, you know, use my wings to fly right at him. And then two hands out, bump my mic, Uh, two hands out, two algic blasts. I curl my fingers like I'm gripping into sand. Yank it close. Gotta hit my mic again. Yank it closer and pull him towards me. I'm coming for you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the end of your turn? Uh, yep, that's all my actions. Zero, you probably didn't have your sword drawn because of the tray of canopies, so I'm not granting you an attack of opportunity against Syrian, although they left your melee range. Okay. There's no way he was holding canopies. I'm gonna go time. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me describe the scene for you. You are starting your turn within 30 feet of Syrian because he's 20 feet away from you. He got pulled. So now he's 20 feet from you and 20 feet from Simmond and Willie and 90 feet from or 80 feet from the deck. Because you're starting your turn within 30 feet of Syrian and he's activated this annihilating aura, you must make a constitution saving throw. Don't forget that as a paladin, you get your charisma bonus. It's like a fat. No, wait, hold on. Um, a 15 that fails so you feel the blood get sucked out of the pores on your skin and kind of like float out of your body get sucked out of your body like welling up like there's these blood bloody tooth mushrooms it looks like that where the red droplet is welling up out of your skin take 14 necrotic damage and syrian gets advantage on attack rolls against you until the start of its next until until the start of your next turn okay is he still within melee range He's 20 feet from you, closer to the deck than you are. Okay. Across these pine wood floorboards. Well, that changes my whole move then. I'm going to go ahead and walk towards him and draw my sword and hit him. So a 21. That hits armor class of 14. He's wearing mage robes. So it'll be a total of 17 damage. What type? Um, there's Radiant Damage, which is 1d8, there's 2 Lightning, which are 2d6s, and 1d8 from the sword. Plus... Tell me how many of each damage type, because he's got resistances, so he's not going to take the full number from certain damage types. Oh, hold on, let me re-roll then. And I need to know if your sword is magical or not. It is. Okay. It's Lightning Tongue. So the lightning damage is a total of three, and the um, the sword damage itself is a one, and then the... So it's slashing? Yep, slashing. One slashing damage? Okay. All right. Yep. And then the radiant damage is three damage, and then it just says plus ten damage on top of that as a normal damage, so I'm not sure... That's more slashing. Yeah, that's slashing. Okay. All right, just to let you guys know, Syrian is down to 261 hit points. So your slash just cuts his clothes, and he he looks at you over his shoulder and smiles. That's okay. I'm going to attack him again. I have an extra attack. (laughs) So it's going to hit. So a total of six lightning damage, 13 slashing, and one holy. Okay, 244. Still looking great. Is that the end of your turn? Yep. Okay. It's Syrian's turn. And although he was ripped from your arms by Willie's Eldritch Blast, you slashed his back 
He looks over his shoulder at you, turns and faces you completely, and you grant advantage to him as he... Let me roll to see if he recharges his... Nope, not recharge. Okay. So he holds his, his hand up to your cheek again, and the blood leaves your cheek and floats to his hand as you take... Does a 17 hit you? No. Uh, no damage, because both of these missed. He made a reaching and pulling motion, and blood exited your body, but you pulled your face away. Do you say anything to him? Oh, he has advantage against you. <laughs> Only the first one missed. Let's roll with advantage on the second one. Does a non-natural 20 hit you? Yes. The second one hits. Take 28 necrotic damage. As he pulls his other hand around, takes your face by both cheeks, and kisses you. Ew, gross. Ew, gross. If you don't want that, it didn't happen. Let me know. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, because you were like, write this story with my ex-lover. And I'm like, okay. Oh, he's a freaking creep. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a creep move. That's why you're killing him. <laughs> you, listeners, he designed the character. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I sure did. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, what you want happen to happen happens there. Like, out of game. Anyway, so uh, mm -hmm. now we're... I love how the DM's more uncomfortable with this than the player. <laughs> Chill out, dude. <laughs> okay. Just because I'm right, a zombie, it's fine. <laughs> we're on to Simmon. Simmon, you start your turn within 20 feet of... Oh, wait. Yeah, because Zero walked up to him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Simmon, you're within 20 feet. So, just to orient you guys, Zero and Syrian are 20 feet from Simmon and Willy. And you're all, like, 80 feet from that deck. Okay, so Simmond, you start your turn within 30 feet of Syrian, so please make a constitution saving throw. Uh, 16. You fail your constitution saving throw, which means you grant advantage to him. Okay, and you take 14 necrotic damage as the blood soars through the air as little droplets and to Syrian. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you take 14 necrotic damage? Doing it now. Okay. And then it's your turn. All right, so Simmond is done playing Mr. Nice Guy. Do I still have my iron plant shears? Yeah. I believe a, a regular item deals a regular D4 of damage, but they're made of iron. I'm going to try something and just walk up and stab them straight into his chest. So you're making an improvised weapon attack? Yes. You Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a a pass. I'm going to give you two turns the next time we come to you, okay? No, they're iron. Don't they auto kill him? <laughs> Improvised weapons do like no damage and no, no, it's no. like a d4. I'm not going to waste that. your turn on that. No, he's trying to work on the iron v fairy. Thing. Exactly. They're iron, aren't they? Isn't that an instant kill? They are hurt by iron and over a long period of time, yes, they could die from it, but it's, I'm sorry you can't one shot the boss. We're going to give you two turns the next time it's your turn. Zero, we're back to you. He he sucked the blood out of your face. Oh, okay. wait. Sorry, Willie's turn. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. I have my stuff pre-rolled. I'm a good boy. <laughs> and my damage is listed out by type. Okay. It'll take two freaking seconds. Yeah, Willie's turn. Sorry. Closing the distance. Oh, now also, within... at the start of your turn, everyone else looks like they're really affected by being so close to Syrian. You don't feel anything. Mm -mm, I'm dead. Yeah, undead or immune uh, to annihilation. There's words. only there's only one thing that makes me feel something, and a freaking hell slug is threatening her soul. So, uh, like bashing through a wall, uh, I fully whiff on my first attack. <laughs> like an absolute <laughs> miss. I got a four on the dice. Not good. Um, AC fourteen. The record. Oh, well, that's a hit then, but this one will not be as impressive. So I'll, I'll roll it real quick, tack the damage on. Boop, 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 doppity doop. Um, the second one, though, with my Hexblade's curse, as stated, allows me to crit on a 19. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And being a paladin, it allows me smites. And I took a little invocation called Eldritch Smite. So, uh, including my second hit, which was a, which was a hit. Um, nine, twelve. Um, okay, plus twelve. Just remember the number twelve. Twenty-seven points of like physical slashing damage from my sword. And your sword is magical. It erupted from the place where your heart once beat. Yeah, where Roxy lives now. Ah, um, and how much damage was that? Let me. Uh, twenty-seven raw. Nice from a magic weapon. 
on top of that, I do my uh, Eldritch Smite, in which I use my highest level Warlock spell slot for an extra 4d8. Now, because of the crit, that's doubled. That's going to be a total of 35 force damage. Nice. On top of that, we have an additional 30 points of Radiant for a regular Paladin Smite. And just for flavor, you know that silly little Barbarian level I have? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm actually uh, a Zealot Barbarian, which adds a normally 1d6 critting to 2d6 of necrotic damage. I got the light magic. I got the dark magic. I'm physical. I'm force. <laughs> I am everything it takes to kill you, you <laughs> freaking bug. So they are immune a... to necrotic damage, just to let you know. All right. Well, uh, actually, I get to choose. So next turn, I will be changing that necrotic to radiant. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, so that's a total of one... Uh, 107 damage plus whatever um, resistances. But for the listeners, come on. Come 107? On. I, can hate. Wait, I got 17, 35, and 30. 27. Oh, and, oh yeah. Hold it's on. 15, 35, 38, plus my raw damage bonuses, like my strength and all that. And then the proficiency because of uh, my Hexblade curse. Just, it should be about a, a hundred bucks worth of damage. Yeah, so 244 minus, uh, I think you said 30 minus 35 minus 17. Well, I'll give you that eight. Okay, yeah, so they're down to 154 hit points. Dang. Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Did you just slash? Oh, no, he's been run through before by zero, and now he gets run through by you. <laughs> oh, it's not like a run through. It's slashing damage, not piercing. <laughs> so it's I'm like charging at him, dragging my giant sword against the floor, sending sparks, and then it's a full <laughs> upswing that if it was a killing blow, would have bisected this bug from like leg to opposite shoulder. But it just... It only got half of him. <laughs> wow. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Zero, he's very close to your face. It's your turn next, right? And so what you see is his pained reaction to what Willie just did. And you start your turn, Zero, within 30 feet of him. So make a constitution saving throw. So 23. 23. You, you pass. You pass this time. You do not take any necrotic damage, and they don't have advantage on you. All right. Okay, I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to Staggering Smite him, which hits. So that is going to do a total of 12 Slashing, 6 Holy, 10 Psychic, and 5, um, what am I thinking of, Lightning Damage. And then he's going to have to make Wisdom Saving Throws according to the spell. All right, you have reduced him from 154 to 124 damage after resistances, and the wisdom saving throw is honestly not high. That's only a six. Okay, he's I think shocked. My... He's he's not felt this pain since the last time he saw you. Uh huh. These freaking Echo Blim think they can mess with souls. So he now has a disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks and can't take reactions until the end of the next turn. So I'm going to go ahead and stab him again. It's going to hit. And that will be a total of 16 slashing, 7 holy, and 9 um, electric damage or lightning damage. You feel like that lightning's not doing as much as... Uh, it should. But yeah, reduced down. Uh, he's got a second slash. I mean, not as deep as the one Willie did to him, but welling up on him. Yeah. And now, is that the end of your turn? That's the end of my turn. He starts his turn with disadvantage on attack and ability and no reaction. And he's going to roll to see if the aneurysm recharges. It does not. Wow. He's... So there's a condition in 4E that's called bloody, where they, like, stagger and, like, think about things. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's thinking that's about things. A encourage players to not give up in a hard combat <laughs> is it okay yeah because then they're like well how much hp do they have well i can't tell you but they are bloodied yeah so <laughs> he clutches his giant gaping wound from willie and holds out a hand to you zero but it's not to suck the blood out of you it's it's to say i thought you were like me the world treated us both <clears throat> badly why do you defend them 
I am nothing like you. You want to murder and kill innocent people just so you can get ahead of the world in the world, and I am nothing like that. <laughs> and as you say that, as he coughs blood in your face, oh man, it's a very blood. Mm, blood That's real just... hot. <laughs> okay. You're all blood and eyeballs today. <laughs> <laughs> he is twenty feet away from Simmond, who he has advantage on. And he's just going to take out your friend so he can talk to you some more. So he's going to move to Simmond. I does have blood and eyeballs today. <laughs> that, does he move out does, of my range? So that does leave... Uh, there we go. That does leave the combat range of zero, zero. You can have an attack of opportunity against him. This is one attack. So when you multi-attack as a paladin, this is just one slash. Go ahead and roll that. Is he if still he in my range? Yeah, so he does leave your range as well. So I have you, yeah, you ran up, you slashed him, so you and Zero are at the same spot where he was, but cool. yeah, so both of you can do one attack of opportunity against him. Okay, so I hit, I do a total of uh, four electric damage, 13 slashing, and five holy. Yeah, and Willie? Uh, 10 damage from me, but I don't know if it's important, but I do have... Uh, a my sword is magic. What is it called? A uh, blade of true death. So he, the, any target I hit with a melee attack cannot regain hit points until the end of their next turn. So it just like you know, like mm -hmm. troll regeneration. So if the even if this thing is attempting to heal, <laughs> he's not. <laughs> no. But yeah, yeah. But really it's makes you dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what d type was that? Ten. Uh, straight up slashing from a magic weapon. Got it. Yeah, down to sixty-seven hit points. And as oh, he crap. stands... Oh, crap! It's more than that, because I get my proficiency. Um, 15. 62? Okay. So he's he moves to Simmond, and he's jealous. He's just a jealous type. I know there's nothing between you and Simmond. Simmond's heart is for Aaron, but uh, he's going to try to explode the, all the blood out of Simmond's body. I'm going to roll to hit. Does a 25 hit you, Simmond, for the first attack? Yep. And does a, I think a 24 also hits. Yep. First, take 28 necrotic damage as he reaches and pulls, ripping the blood out of your body into the air. Good, good enemy design, Zero's player. <laughs> How much damage? First, 28 necrotic damage. Uh-huh. And then make a constitution saving throw. Okay. I should have been reading this the whole time. If you fail this constitution saving throw, your hit point maximum is reduced by an amount equal to the necrotic damage taken Ooh. until you finish a long rest. Yeah. He's 17. a mean boy. Yeah. So your hit point maximum is reduced by 28 until you finish a long rest. Okay. It should have been. It, it's written on the paper. One would think I would read it. But um, anyway, so, and then the second hit also hits and take another 28 necrotic damage and make another constitution saving throw. Uh, 11. Also fails. So in total, you lost 56 total hit points. They're in the air around you. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> that ends his turn. He's within 30 feet of everyone, just to remind you. Simon, do you get two turns? Mm-hmm. What do you do for your first turn? Uh, for my first turn, I am going to create a bonfire underneath Syrian. Okay, hold on. Give me a sec while I read that. I don't have that spell myself. It's a cantrip. 1d8 bonfire. Um, it's actually 4d8 because we're level 17. Oh, it scales? That's dope. It does. That's um, fun. However, you have to make a dex saving throw. Mm. Dexterity saving throw of 21. Okay, yeah. No damage for that. So that was one action. What else are you doing? Wall of thorns. Because remember, I have two turns. Yes. I create a wall of tough, pliable, tangled bristles. The wall appears within a range. Yeah. He'll make a dexterity saving throw for your wall of thorns. Thank you. 18. Uh, he fails. Um, so 78 piercing, which is 32 piercing damage. This is going to make a... And, and I, I'll, also, I read this. It's, this only affects enemies. This does not affect me. I can move through the wall of thorns. Except because I am a druid. So I'm going to make a 20-foot circle of thorns surrounding him that he has to move through as if difficult terrain. One foot of movement takes four feet of movement for him to move through. And anytime he ends his turn within this, he is still going to have to make that same save. All right, you sure about that? Mm, pretty sure. Okay, you're certain? What do you mean? I'm just confirming. Why? 
because everyone Zero else is twenty Willy feet away from him. Also correct? twenty feet away. Just just close enough that it, that I'm not affecting my other players. All right, that's very nice of you. Yes, <laughs> I would like to point out you are currently in concentration. So when you take damage, remind me that you have to make a concentration check. All right. Yes. Oh, okay. here's a question too. Can I? As I have now encased him in thorns, and he has is very difficult for him to move, and he is five feet away from me at this moment, would he still get an opportunity of attack if I retreat through, through, through the thorns? Yes. Because <sighs> difficult terrain doesn't stop attacks of opportunity, does it? I'm not sure. It only has movement speed, and also your bonfire is gone. Why? What? Because that's while, concentration. Yeah, so oh, your yeah, previous concentration. Which is good, because now I can go up and stab him while he's all tangled up, instead of having to walk through fire, but I did want to do that, so... You'd have to walk through thorns. Yeah, you might want to do some, something ranged here. No, oh, no, 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 Willie's getting up in it. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> you have thorned out... Oh, wait, how much damage did that do? Uh, 32 piercing damage. Yeah, holy cow. More than half of his remaining hit points. He's hanging up. I'm not going to do a Jesus on the cross scene because this dude doesn't deserve it, but he's definitely impaled by thorns. Uh, he's not worthy of that, but um, he's he's sagging. He's He's held up by the very vines that impale him, and he turns and he looks at... Oh, and you didn't move away, did you? I did not, and actually, okay. in hindsight, I'm going to make this a very narrow circle of thorns just because... <laughs> <laughs> I would like other players to be able to reach him and finish this off. He's he's not going to wander through these. It's not going to get to my next turn. So five-foot circle. He is within melee range without people impaling themselves. Yeah. Which is good, because, I mean, Willie. You know what's coming. Narrate. You know if what's you, coming. If you're doing more than 30, just narrate. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't like Echo Blim. I feel like that's been established. Mm -hmm. Uh... We're in a battle. Willie full-on walks through the wall of thorns that Simon created, like, tearing at his flesh, no blood dropping, just an image of intent murder as I approach this Echo Blem. Very simply, uh, you know, uh, just for just for the crunch of it, uh, 27 raw damage, mm -hmm. and then after Sim the end of his turn, I was like, I can finish this with a smite, so I dropped my last... Uh, fourth level warlock spell slot, second level paladin spell slot, 37 more damage. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, total over 60. And, uh, like, keeping it nice lethal and gory. Or non lethal? Non lethal, but listen how I do it. I do mm -hmm. one of those impaled, uh, like, in a tree by a car, and they're like, if we move the car, he'll die. I skewer him stomach to neck. And, like, hold him on my blade, because it's real big. And then I just set it down, walk over to Simon, and look over to Zero. And go, I, I, I think he, he doesn't have much time left, but I figured you might have something to say to him. The last thing Syrian sees before he closes his eyes is he looks away from the sword. So, like, picture most of his vision is obscured by the shadow of the falling blade, or rising blade, ooh, coming out of him. As he, like collapses into unconsciousness because it's non-lethal damage. He looks to Zero. His love. <laughs> <laughs> Zero just walks over and just does the finishing blow, just a stab right to him. Okay, it was non-lethal damage, now it's lethal. Syrian, goodbye. We're crossing you off the character list. <laughs> and that activates my accursed specter. So I get his soul now. Oh, he didn't or, have one. Uh... Sorry. I want to at least tug at it and see if I can find the magical trail. Like, you know, the the one stray uh, bit of string that unravels the whole sweater. So, yeah. like, as it doesn't work, I still grab into that void and got you now, Echo Blim. You could find his soul. I'll say that. You have, a, a like, a red thread of fate between you and his soul. You're linked now. Ew. Mm. You can't undo Good. that link. He can find you and you can find him. Cool. You think I'm a scurd? <laughs> I have friends, because my unbeating heart is still capable of love, which is more than one of these bugs can do. I kick him in the ribs, and I look at Zero, and I go, Would you like me to raise him as a corpse and make him dance around a little bit, or are we done with him? 
No, I think we're done with him. I was done with him very many years ago. Like, let's just move on. One more kick in the ribs. Um, so we're cool, right? Like, I look around the room. Combat over. Yeah. Um, and Zero's player, how you feel? You got to kill your uh, ex. I, I had like two requests. I had a bunch of requests from this game. One of them was work in Syrian. What do you think? How do you? You okay? Go okay. Yeah, it feels great. <laughs> Just cutting off that, you know, that loose end that should have been cut off a long time ago. Yeah, you're free. So I'm going to go over to that portal window and see if my finger plan worked. It did. They're buzzing around it. They feel like their defenses are not adequate because a finger got through. So they're going to completely chomp away the entire gold circle. And perhaps they'll be contacting Guasso in a later adventure. DM. Bye. DM. Bye, not Eberron. Willie DM. <laughs> oh, well, hell yeah, dude. Maybe that world will contact Guasso in a future adventure. Willie hey, DM. maybe you should check back next season. <laughs> well, anyway, so it's it's a possible way for you guys to get rid of the Ek Emblem. You can just scooch them out of your world, too. I just like these future dudes. They seem cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, joining us this time, we're... Simon. Whoa, 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 that's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, we're done, that's it. What? You guys have anything else you want to do? Yeah, like, uh, yell at that demon, escape the hive, like... Did we collect we just... enough information to report back and... I don't know. I don't know, I just... I look out the window. I don't know. I, oh, okay. I mean, I I'm like half to... dead, so I don't know. Oh, okay. Lay on hands. <laughs> oh, no, you're hit pool, Max. So, yeah, you need to go to bed. All right. Well, <laughs> literally, you need to go to bed. Um, shoot. Well, I'm going to grab everything from his desk that I can. Mm. You know, um, I'm going to take the dust. I'm going to... Oh, oh, you're you know generating what? dust. Okay. Well, I make the ring so we can go back. Mm. Zero, I hope you don't mind. I think I actually might take his corpse. Do with it whatever you want, except reanimate him, please. Oh. I cannot deal with this any longer. Damn, that was 100% <laughs> what I was going to do. I just wanted to test an echo blim, like, to the, the limits of life and death. I, I motion sort of where there should be a window of, like, the sea of writhing zombies. These are my people. I need to not only save Guasso, but all of these poor fools. And I think this poor fool, I kick his corpse again, might be the key to doing it. Can he be reanimated without a soul, question mark? Oh, yeah, no, my zombies are super dumb. Literally, I got one of my teeth replaced with a whistle that cost me 300 gold pieces. It's not, it's not sentient magic, it's just making the corpse move. Like, his soul is gone, but I do have a tether to that, and I think this unique set of circumstances... Might be the key to something. As long as it helps us get closer to the queen, I don't care, so we can just end this. Oh, dude, you, like, skirmish is like <laughs> dating the queen. Like, <laughs> like, I'm doing this as I'm setting a circle. If you want to talk to her, like, she's probably at the guild hall. We ran into each other Wait, on the isn't way. isn't the queen? Huh? Isn't the queen the person we're supposed to eventually kill? Question mark? That's to be decided. We need them to stop invading. And, you know, oh. we like it. Skirmish might feel... He, he called her his girlfriend, question mark? Yeah, remember earlier in the adventure <laughs> when they were like, when the queen gets back from her date, she's going to be mad. I do not. Uh, she's dating Skirmish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. If you want to wrap it, DM, I would be happy on wrapping it, like <laughs> doing the circle, taking this corpse, and then... Setting up a conversation between the Queen of the Echo Blim Zero and Skirmish, which I could, I feel like would be very fruitful. <laughs> yes, let's call it, I guess. Um, so you guys can make a portal because you're generating your own dust now. Careful where you fly over with that. So you all decide to go home and tell Anaril about what you learned? If you flap your wings and gather dust and create a portal to go home... With every flap of your new Ekenblim wings, a bit of fairy dust floats off into the air, hanging there for a second, stirred in the vortex of turbulence before settling to the ground. You gather the dust into a circle, step inside, and sing. And then, you know, I'll make you sing again. The gold dust resonates with the notes you sing. It vibrates and lights up, getting brighter and brighter. Whoosh! 
bright light and golden sprinkles are all you can see. You're safely on your way back to Nikimui. And with that, we'll end our adventure. If you want when to can I rip the rings out? Like, are we just, like, But are we always going to have them there? Is it like no, no. cutting off a mole or a wart where it just keeps growing back? No, or? gosh, no. no. Unless you go in another egg case. I mean, if you want to teleport inside an egg case during that moment of echimplimification, you can get wings again. And if you want to... No? I just don't know if I'm going to keep them or not. I guess hang on to that until next episode. Yeah. Yeah, you can lose them. You can keep them. Any dust that you shed will reanimate corpses, and they'll like be like brains, and then they'll like shuffle towards somebody and like try to eat them. So you're responsible for that, which is what destroyed this world. In fact, you look out, I guess this luxurious palatial space has a window to the outside world. Not that anyone would want to look at that. But if you look not up at the blue sky, but down at the ground, it's a, a wasteland full of thousands of shambling corpses. Of, like, all the animals and people who used to live here before Ekenblim. Oh. Okay. That's what your world will become if you don't stop everything from always reanimating. Because dead things should rot, you know? Whoa. Eh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's like, oh, Ekenblim, Ekenblim, Ekenblim. There are thousands of my shambling people out there that everyone is totally ignoring. I, I, you know what? I got half a mind. To take over this world <laughs> and give a safe space for the for the recently undeceased. I'm the king keep... of all creation could. I'm just gonna keep my wings and encase them in tree sap. Yeah, I'm gonna make mine <laughs> cool and goth, and I'm gonna figure out how to not only make zombies but make them cool. They'll ride skateboards and stuff. <laughs> That's a yes on the druid encased in sap wings for Sim and the kind. Mm -hmm. Your wing dust is. Sticky, contained. sticking to the wings, sticking. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm thinking they just won't shed. They're, they're they're encased. They're covered. I can pull them out if I need them. If they, these 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 things could be useful for research purposes later. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're not they're non shedding. You know, you you're like this was easy. Why don't the Echimblim care enough to do this to their own wings? True. Yeah. I have my billowing cloak of holding, so I'm just gonna have my wings partially in a bag all the time. <laughs> You're hoovering your own. You got to change the vacuum bag every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> don't go into my liminal space. It's super dusty in there. <laughs> and zero. <laughs> Margaret's pissed. I'm, I'm going to cut them off. I can fly with a lightning girdle anyway, so I don't really need them. You leave the wings next to Syrian and you walk away. Joining yeah. us today were zero. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Simmon the Kind. Bye, guys. And Willie. Everybody's favorite dead boy signing out. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Have you tried geocaching? It's a real-world-based GPS treasure hunt game played all over the world. It's family-friendly and a great way to get outside. I recommend you check it out. And check out the Geocache Adventures podcast with me, Amy, Shadow Dragon one as I explore the world of geocaching and look at everything geocaching related. There is something there from everyone, whether you're new to geocaching or you're a seasoned veteran. Check out the Geocache Adventures podcast. Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome back to Lonely TTRPG, the solo actual play and review podcast. I am your host, Steel Stas. Join me every week as I play through a new solo TTRPG for y'all. You can find Lonely TTRPG on your favorite podcasting site, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen. If you're more of a visual learner, just look for The Black Dragon Dungeon Company on YouTube.com. Remember, just because you're playing alone doesn't mean you have to start alone. See you soon, Wanderer.